pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which it stands, one nation, without indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ten times we said it, I still think I'm going to mess up. Like every time, every single time, we don't get it. Uh, okay, I don't see any adjustments. Uh, you don't have any feedback? No adjustments tonight. Everybody okay? We're good, we're good, we're good. Uh, approval of minutes. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the Monday, March 1st, 2021 regular meeting at 6 p.m., the Monday, March 22nd, 2021 executive session at 4 p.m., and the minutes for Monday, March 22nd, 2021 executive session at 4.45 p.m. So moved. Second from Mr. Rue. Any discussion? All in favor? All in favor? Go. Public comments. Do we have anybody who would like to make public comments? I think I heard that uh, Mr. Peterson wanted to say something. Peter Min, sorry. <laughs> a long day, sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Um, yes, sir. Um, good evening. I'm addressing you tonight as the chair of the Maine Principals Association Cheer Committee. On March 27th, we broadcast a virtual competitive cheering competition out on the NF NFHS network for all four classes and 68 teams in the state. None of this would have been possible without the direction and talents of WSSR TV's program manager, Sarah Schnell. Back in the fall, we at the MPA thought we might have to cancel the 2020-2021 season because NFHS had labeled cheering a high-risk sport. So in an attempt to save a season, I floated an idea by Sarah, and she ran with it. Not only did she help create an outstanding show, but the NFHS network head thought it was the best cheering event he had seen put together this winter. Thanks to Sarah, we were one of the few sports in the state to be able to award a champion and a runner-up for all four classes during the winter season. Thank you, Sarah. We couldn't have done it without you. Keep up the good work. All right. So well said, Mr. Peter. Yay. Excellent work as always from Sarah. We expect nothing less. Uh, do we have anybody else that uh, wants to make public comment? I don't think I see anybody, but I want to put it out there. Okay. Once, going twice, and we will move on. Okay, so communications, I see none. Is that correct, Mr. Nelson? Correct, no communications. Okay, then let's move into committee reports. So construction updates, the floor is yours, Mr. Nelson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, start with Sanford High School, Sanford Regional Technical Center. Uh, we coordinated a conference call this past Friday, April 2nd. We did that as a coordination meeting. Um, the contractor had come out uh, to correct the insulation at the main entrance. Uh, after receiving notice from us that it was our intent to self-perform that work, via another contractor. So that was good news that they came out and they were able to um, complete that work, but we had also asked them uh, for an update on the current punch list. They did not provide an update on the current punch list. Uh, so we met last Friday, uh, participating in that meeting um, were um, Jim Harford from the Maine Department of Education Lance Whitehead from the architect of LaValle Brensinger Associates. Um, Sanford School Department was represented by myself and Principal Matt Peterman and SRTC Director Kathy Sargent, our Facilities and Director uh, and Maintenance Director uh, Don Nichols. Uh, we also had members from RFS there. So that was really done as a coordination meeting for next steps. We did review the punch list um, we went through that. We decided which items are critical to be performed and how we could remedy those issues using contractors other than um, Hutter and how that could be accomplished. Um, so uh, we worked through that on Friday. We got a punch list of about 30 items or so. And so um, 
Today, I notified Hutter of our intent to self-perform that part of the work. Uh, they did respond to us uh, with what they have to this point, uh, which shows that the work still hasn't been done. So uh, I've been working with our legal counsel so that we can uh, respond to them uh, in the way to show that the work is not done and that we do uh, plan to um, utilize uh, outside contractors to get that work done unless uh, they change their minds. Uh, the way the general conditions are in our contract is that before we can self-perform any work, we have to notify them and give them three days. So uh, right now uh, we are in the process of finalizing uh, what my response would be to be able to report back to them uh, that we still intend to move forward uh, performing the work, especially in some of the things that we have is uh, with April vacation coming up, uh, it might be an opportune time for some of those items uh, to get finished. So uh, that's the latest update on the high school and technical center. Um, I'm also looking to have a core building committee meeting. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, um, I'm sorry, I'll report that later on when I talk about the uh, Sanford Pride Elementary update. But are there any questions on the high school or regional technical center uh, uh, project? No, I think you're good, Matt. Carry so, on. Stanford Pride Elementary, our converted elementary school, the project continues to make positive efforts forward. Um, structure tones, painters, and uh, the school department's uh, painters are making progress in the building, most notably up in the area A. Corridor wall smoke ceiling required by code is being placed also in area A, and it's working its way into area B upper. General drywall install is completed in the upper level and is beginning in the lower levels. BCT and ceiling installs in the upper areas are gearing up to start this week and should be in full swing by the middle of the week. Toilet room porcelain tile has been ongoing is near completion in area A and it's being installed in area B upper. The plumbing work uh, is vastly completed up in the upper level and it's ongoing in the lower level. Mechanical work is adding final touches in the upper areas and working on installs in the lower level. Electrical, electrical code fixes are being worked on in area A and the lighting install in area A should, beginning, uh, should be beginning this week as well. We did get a updated uh, schedule from the uh, contractor structure tone last Friday. The schedule outlines the more recent uh, change orders that have been accepted. Uh, those change orders do equate to a fair amount of extra work. Based on many of those ad structure toners reporting that they need some extra time to finalize their work. The updated schedule has the project being substantially completed about one month after the original construction schedule. Originally, they were looking at substantial completion on June 1st. Right now, they're looking at June 30th. Uh, I do want to point out that that does not include the work to replace all of the ceilings, grids, and lights. That's not part of the current uh, scope of work. That's something that we've done uh, through the bond, um, the local bond, as well as working with the core building committee. This is an item that we've requested. It does, uh, and it will remount, uh, result in a uh, fair amount of work. Uh, we're not sure yet since we haven't received their uh, proposal if it's gonna be accepted. Um, if that was to be accepted, uh, what they're anticipating is uh, substantial completion by the end of July. Uh, and that would be only for the ceiling and the lighting work. Um, they did let uh, Harriman know that uh, structure tone is that they did have not confirmed the lead times for the lights. So uh, when we're talking about a late July timeframe, that's an estimate for those proposals, but we're waiting for the final proposal with confirmed schedule adjustments. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Harriman has reviewed the schedule with structure tone. Uh, and we've been, they've been very upfront with Structure Tone, letting them know that we would like to start moving into uh, the completed areas as they become available. 
and the contractor does not see any issue with this schedule. So for an example, uh, area A is much further along. And so we'd still be able to move in area A for June 1st. The area B upper level, uh, they're um, planning for that to be ready June 9th. Area B lower level completion for June 16th. And then uh, for that June 30th date, when we talk about the whole building being substantially completed, that would involve area C, that's the lower area uh, for June 30th um, for that. I also uh, talked about in the past about some flooring, uh, gym flooring issues um, for that. As uh, some expected, any flooring uh, placed down in, the, in those areas will require floor leveling in order for that to meet the um, warranty requirements. The uh, installer recognizes the joints in the slab as control joints. They had originally thought that those were expansion joints <laughs> And so therefore they are able to proceed without the suggested pinning of the slabs, which is gonna be very helpful. Um, we are waiting for a proposal on the grinding and leveling of the slab to achieve the required levels for the floor warranty um, for that. Also in regards to the uh, front paneling, uh, we have reached out to the manufacturer to see if the panels uh, that are currently blue, if we could uh, paint those to red. Uh, the product uh, does inherently resist graffiti paint, dirt, and such. So it's important for us to make sure that the manufacturer weighs in on any possible painting and the proper painting procedures, if that's an appropriate way that uh, we'd like to uh, proceed to make sure it's got, um, it works long-term, it's durable, uh, in the event that we want to change that. And so right now uh, we have reached out to the manufacturer and we are awaiting their response. Uh, I have uh, looking to schedule our next core building committee meeting a week from tomorrow. That would be Tuesday, um, April 13th at uh, three o'clock. So we can continue to uh, move along um, and work on things. So any uh, questions on the um, elementary update? Matt, I've got a couple. Um, on, on the extra ceiling tile light work, if, I mean, Structure Tone didn't see any reason for delays on the last project that they did either. So could, could the ceiling tiles and lights be done a year later? Yes. And, and that's an option that we're going to have to consider. Uh, we've been upfront with that as we try to work on these uh, local items that we're adding. Uh, we we got to be very careful that we don't add scope that's going to hold up the, the uh, timeline of the project. But that is an option for us that we could go in and be able to do that down the line. Obviously, we'd have to do that when school is not in session. So that have to be on, you know, school vacations and, and summer vacations and whatnot. No, that was just, that seems logical. Sounds crazy. But... I thought you said you had two questions. Is that just one? Did I, I kind of blend it? Did I sew it out for a I, second? No, I blended through. <laughs> I, I guess I, would, I was just kind of thinking back about how long the high school has been like finished. And just, you know, is, is we're about three years out, right? Two to, two to three years, I would say. And so what what is their reasoning? I mean, as a contractor, it doesn't look good for them to have a punch list still going on. It, it's almost embarrassing. Like, I almost want to, like, blast it out, but, like, don't use this company. So, so, I know, but I, I, think just, you just, I think you just did. <laughs> so, now some of that is um, th there's a variety of things, uh, Amy. There's um, some situations where they, the contractor, has reached out to their subcontractors uh, asking them to do the work. The subcontractors have told them that they're going to do the work and yet it still hasn't been finished. Or in some ways, those subcontractors have gone radio silent. And so Structure Tone's kind of putting their hands up in the air. There are other some disagreements where they say something is done and we disagree that it is. 
There's also some other disagreements on how the work was done, uh, as well as that's something that we're not accepting um, for that. So I think it's a variety of things that are going back and forth, but we've reached a point where right now we're raising that ante to say we're we're just going to go and um, not wait anymore and look at those things uh, that we might be able to do in-house or at least those things that we've got our own um, local contractors that we could have perform the work. And then they would they would be responsible to pay the bill. Yeah, well, that's where the fun starts, right? Where we would we we've withheld that money from their retainage, and we would then use that money to pay the people who did the work. And so, that's where there could be a potential conflict or disagreement uh, regarding those those particular areas. So that's why I've reached out with legal counsel, so to make sure that as we are responding here, we're doing that in a way that um, has us covered. But you know, Matt, with the retainage that we kept, and from what the cost were going to be two years ago, is the retainage still adequate for the scope of work that needs to be done? Yeah, and when we met on Friday uh, in that coordination meeting, that was a question that came up, and uh, I would feel that uh, for the majority of items, we felt very good about that. There were a couple where um, there was some question on that that we're looking into further to make sure that is the case. Any other questions on the high school? I, I do. Getting back to uh, Jonathan's question about the um, ceiling tiles and the lights, one thing that, uh, and I think that's a, a option that we have, is to postpone that work till later on and not hold up uh, the schedule, the timeline. And I've been upfront in those meetings that I've had with the staff to let them know that that may be a case, right? When you move in there, you may be looking at some ceiling tiles or something to say, hey, that needs to, and that's the thing we'd have to be able to continue to communicate with uh, our public and people was that it's not a finished project, uh, project, even though we're moving in, we still have some items to be able to come back and update. And that's just part of the coordination that we've done where the timing was not ideal it's great news that we were able to get that local bond, but all along we've had to be able to juggle and balance that with the ongoing part of the project as well. Steve, I think listening to um, the safety committee this afternoon, it was Bob, Moon, Bob Noon brought up a topic about how to lift the spirits up within all things school, parents, kids, teachers. Um, I, I think a delay of any kind getting into that school next September would just be horrible for all of us. So. The word delay just, that's, that's not a happy word these days. Nope, and, and that's why we've been working through then. You saw part of the report was us being able to move in at staggered times and not being able to work that out. For us, June 1st comes, we're still going to be in school. Willard is still going to be going to school at Willard. And so, and they, you know, there's not going to be situations where everything is going to be packed up then anyways. So that's what we've been pushing on is uh, still pushing that we want uh, June, not any later than June. Uh, and we're, um, that's a push now that I've been bringing up in our construction meetings because we've got a lot of moving parts here. As we start to be packing and moving, we want to make sure that we're uh, efficient in all of those efforts and not having to come back and pack or unpack or be able to mess up the different timelines that we have. So uh, I've, I've mentioned that and I'll continue to emphasize that all along the way here because you're right, a delay is unacceptable and we can't have it. Okay, cool. Uh, let's move on then. Uh, Performing Rights Committee, is that anything uh, follow? Yes, I spoke with Brett today and we were talking about how it's nice to see um, so much interest in the Performing Arts Center. We have uh, lots of dance competitions that are going to be coming up, um, not just this spring, but in the summer. And that's a nice little economic driver because we've got people coming from all, you know, all over the state um, and they'll be in town. So they'll bring families in and <clears throat> everybody needs to go eat somewhere in between competitions and everything. So we thought that was really good. Uh, let's see. 
the student performances are starting May 6th, 7th, and 8th. They are going to be live starting at 7 p.m. And there's live streaming on the 8th at 7 p.m. for those who don't feel comfortable going to the Performing Arts Center. And the show is the Broadway Review that the kids have been working on. Uh, the show must go on. And there's 35 high school students involved in this production, which is awesome. very good. Um, so they're really excited about that. Um, there's six dance recitals this spring. So the whole, I mean, we're booked for this whole spring season. There's only one weekend from now till June that there's nothing going on at the um, Performing Arts Center. So that's really good. And now with different seating configurations, we can seat up to 300. So that opens it up for more people to come and enjoy. The new season is definitely starting on November 20th with all sorts of touring performances. And um, the PAC is also open for all senior events happening at the end of this year. Oh, cool. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, cool. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> Um, WSSR TV, uh, we had a call, I think it was a couple weeks ago now. Yeah. Um, essentially, we kind of focused on discussing, kind of getting back to that conversation about where we were going with WSSR TV, um, kind of the structure behind it, um, and then also a lot of discussion about, because uh, there's been talk on the city side about using some marketing money, uh, you know, what that was going to look like as far as the interaction uh, with WSSR. Um, because I think we all know Sarah's pretty much already really busy, so I'm not sure you know anything else can go on her plate. Um, I believe we have a leadership uh, meeting this week, yep. um, so I was going to bring that up as one of the topics to discuss uh, with the mayor and deputy mayor and uh, city manager and see if they have any ideas or if they've even really thought about that yet. Um, well, is it? Are they genuine about it, or is it just you know ongoing lip service? Well, that's the thing. Yeah, we've had this conversation over and over. I think we're at the point now where it's like you know let's let's get some uh, details down on paper yeah. and figure it out. Um, so I'm not sure. It's like, is it going to be something where they want it working in parallel with WSSR? WSSR is just kind of going to be a a tool that whoever is doing this marketing stuff can access. Are they expecting WSSR to generate content? Which I'm not sure. Looks like you're doing a little dance moves. Just, just sorry. Tap shoes. Sorry. Hey, go ahead. Quick question: How many people are viewing WSSR? Is there a set number that you know of? Well, it depends on the events, but I know. I mean, is there subscribers? Yeah, they've got the YouTube channel is over fourteen hundred subscriptions now, which is huge. So that's getting up there. Sarah gave us the numbers. I had them up the other meeting, but it, yeah, it's like thousands and thousands of views. Okay. You know, it depends on the event. So, but it's it's definitely got a lot of traction. Um, and it's hard because the other discussion keeps coming up about the peg channels and the cable, you know, the cable channels. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, how much effort do you want to put into that if that's kind of a dying media form versus mm -hmm. streaming? You know, and with the new franchise coming into town, you know, is that going to be more peg channels or are we just going to mirror the stuff? So it's a, it's, it's a complicated um, topic. Yeah, I mean, I think we're clear on the fact that we think it's a great opportunity and it's got a lot of potential. And I know the city wants to be really involved in it. We definitely want to be really involved in it. But the question that we brought up was, okay, so what is it? What does your involvement look like? Yeah. What are you... How do you see this benefiting the city? How do you want to use it? How do you want to promote it? How do you want to grow it? And so that's what we're supposed to be talking about next meeting. Great. Yeah. So I think what we'll do, we'll have our leadership meeting this week. We'll do that. We'll have the WSSR the next meeting. And then I anticipate maybe coming back to the school committee like next month sometime and say, hey, this is yeah. kind of the, the, the path that we want to follow and make sure everybody here is it agreement with that? So. Isn't, isn't the, the hurdle is money? Ideally, I mean, I guess everything comes down to money. I mean, if yeah, you had if you had the funding, you know, you could stand it up as its own, you know, media station. You know, hire a but like a manager, the old, hire. But, but the, the old way how the state funded trades was we put the money out there versus no, really never. But it was just kind of a trail of money. I think we need to invest the money. The community has to invest the money. To get it going, 
You gotta spend money to make money. Yeah. yeah. So the only way we can make any of this is to jumpstart it with hundreds of thousands of dollars. It isn't gonna take 10 dollars. It's gonna take a couple hundred just to hire some staff and begin the program. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, that's the conversation's kind of looped around that a number of yeah. times. It's like, you know, to really make it go somewhere, okay, you could hire like maybe one or two people to help Sarah, but really, is that really growing too much? If you really wanted to get to where I think everybody envisions it, you have like you said, you're talking the full yeah. staff. You have to put full staff in. And it always comes back around from money to, okay, so then what are we talking? We're hiring how many more people and how much help does Sarah need? And then what are we envisioning? And then it goes back to money. And then it goes back <laughs> to, well, how many people do we hire? Well, look, we, we all speak highly of Sarah. She's doing a heck of a job for yeah. us. Yeah, so. Sarah gets sick. We don't, we don't have a program. So we yeah. have to hire she needs help. She it does, been saying that for two years. It does make you wonder, though, listening to the budget committee and the um, the COVID relief funds that the cities are getting, Sanford's getting, and when you mention about you know money that needing to jumpstart it and knowing that how important it is because of COVID, because of the activities and events that cannot take place other than with WSSSR, um, if if somebody could be used from that fund to jumpstart it yeah, and I without hiding, coming out of the yeah. city's budget. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's definitely on the table. So, you know, so we'll yeah. keep you in the loop. As long as uh, Paula's dog doesn't run away again, we'll be all over it. I'm getting started on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> uh, you get anything for adult ed, uh, Jonathan? I do. I uh, had a brief conversation with Nicole electronically the other day. Um, they do have a live graduation plan for adult ed, June 2nd at 7 p.m. <clears throat> so that is exciting, very exciting for them. If you remember last year, she told us that she and Lisa Blanchett hand delivered diplomas to each of the graduating uh, members of adult ed. So that yeah. was true passion. Uh, she's, and they're still working on the driver ed program. But, um, so, I couldn't account. I didn't reach out to Kendra the other day to let her know because I know she's very passionate about adult ed. So she was excited. How many students? How many students? I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Can we make something up? Make something. I guess it's Jonathan. Is it yep. June second at six or seven? So I know second and seven. I should have oh, said. I should have said four. Okay. Thanks for that. Let's move on to the superintendent's reports. And we'll start out with the student representatives. I think we had all three of them on today. Nice. So we will start with uh, Juliana. Do you have anything to share with us tonight? Yes, I do. I have a few updates for civil rights. So the civil rights team is continuing to work on slides for Autism Acceptance Month for the closed circuit, the closed circuit TVs within the high school. Recent, recently, we've also made some announcements over the intercom regarding the topic of Asian hate. And we're looking into coming up with a social media campaign to battle Asian hate. Excellent. That sounds good, Juliana. Continue the good work. Uh, let's go to Bella. What do you have for us tonight? Anything? Um, yeah, a little bit. So I have two things. One is to add on to um, Ms. Paula's uh, talk about the musical, which we are actually starting um, full cast rehearsals next week. So we're getting closer. That should be fun. Um, and then another thing was I actually am starting a um, free house. And so, sorry, I have siblings yelling in the background. Um, but we are actually going to be doing uh, the farmer's market. And there is another SHS student, um, Sydney Plant, in the farmer's market who has been actually really working towards connecting students um, with the farmer's market and all the uh, programs that they do. So I'd love to really kind of talk more about that with um, some of you and to get Sydney kind of in contact with you guys um, to see how we can kind of spread some more awareness because the, the farmer's market, surprisingly, is not as well known um as some you know sports programs as well as that kind of idea um so we really want to get students connected and involved 
um, because there's really a lot of really cool opportunities and we work with a lot of local places. Um, So I think that would be a really good idea to get students more involved in the community and in other areas of the community. Awesome, that sounds very cool, Bella. Definitely reach out to us whenever you guys are uh, thinking about anything. So, uh, and then uh, Grace, what do you have for us today? Um, I don't have a lot. I'm just echoing what Bella and Miss Paula said. The spring musical is coming together really nicely, and it's going to be very exciting to finally get back to the performing arts with. COVID and everything. And so I think it's going to be really amazing. And I think it's definitely going to lift some spirits. So that's exciting. And then another thing that I've been working on for a couple of months now is um, a survey for student and teacher feedback on the four and five block schedule. So I've been working with a sophomore who like really wants to get involved with this and really wants to make sure that the students and the teachers are being heard equally. And I've been working with Mr. Peterman and Mr. Nelson to get their feedback and hopefully that will go out soon. So, and I'll share the results or the feedback at the next meeting, hopefully. So, yeah. That's great, Grace. (laughs) I I encourage uh, any student advocating for uh, the rest of the student body. So, you're doing a great job. Uh, any questions for any of the student reps from anybody? Okay. Thank you, ladies. Good job. Nice to have all three of you back. Maybe we'll actually meet in person at some point. <laughs> yeah, that would be Maybe. Good. Um, okay, school announcements, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, I'm actually going to put school announcements and positive news kind of together all in one for number five. So I'll uh, put two off for now. I'll jump into the COVID-19 returned in-person learning update. Uh, At our last school committee meeting on March 15th, uh, at that time, we had just started bringing back students uh, who are increasing the in-person learning from our two day a week to four day a week. We had done that at our elementary schools um, in high school. So I'm uh, happy to announce that overall that transition has been working pretty well. Uh, Our schools have kind of treated it a lot like it would be almost um, the beginning of the school year in terms of a a focus on uh, building community and also being um, consistent in, uh, with the health and safety uh, standing operating procedures that we have. Um, right now, um, we have a situation where uh, a lot of our students uh, have come back uh, to go from two days to four days. Um, so things are going really well uh, from that standpoint at the elementary level. Um, You've got things where uh, you it's you go into the buildings now and into the schools and uh, it feels like school, whereas before uh, it didn't feel that way. But now when we've got more kids in the building, they're obviously taking on more opportunities as well. Hopefully with the warmer weather, uh, that's going to help out some of the tight schedules that we have uh, for the cafeteria and for snack breaks. and mass breaks uh, during lunch um, for that. Some of the uh, challenges that we've encountered at the elementary level are around those families um, who have been, um, their students who have been full remote or have been homeschooled uh, in that situation. Because uh, I think as the vaccinations increase statewide, I think you have people uh, who are interested and having their kids return. So we have been able to accommodate everyone uh, at the elementary level who was interested in going from two to four days. At uh, Willard and and, uh, MCS, we've done a nice job of um, of, uh, accommodating um, students, uh, those students. Uh, CJL, it's become a little bit more difficult for the people. We have them on a wait list uh, as we're trying to find placement, uh, we started up uh, last year, last week with 19. We're down to 13. Uh, one of the challenges, though, I think, is we're starting to talk at our level is 
we need to um, kind of determine if there's going to be a cutoff date because anytime that you're bringing in new students, that's a great thing, but it is usually an adjustment and there are some uh, probably um, unexpected uh, pitfalls to that um, for that. So that's something that we're talking about, especially come upcoming with the April vacation because ultimately what's driving everything for us is we got to have the space so we can still do the guidelines. So as far as in-person learning going on um, uh, from two days to four days, that's working well. At the high school, um, there right now, um, we have four day a week students, 531. That's um, almost half of their enrollment. Uh, they still have uh, people right now, there's still 321 students who are full distance learners. And remember at the high school level, we're doing that in a synchronous way. So um, we have been able to accommodate 531 students. Uh, so on A days, we have 634 students in the building. On B days, we have 622 um, for that. So uh, there are challenges there, however, as some of the class sizes are approaching the capacity that we have. There, there's not the state space there where we have the um, desks and the tables and the plexiglass. Um, for that. So what happens is there has to be uh, Mr. Peterman and his administration staff have to get creative and be moving people and spaces around to be able to do that. Um, so all in all, uh, we have been able to accommodate all of those students who are interested in going from two days to four days at Sanford High School. Um, the middle school was able to accommodate uh, the results of the parent survey for those four day in person uh, requests. But in order for them to make that happen at the middle school, they did have to add uh, satellite rooms for each grade level. And so that started today uh, at the middle school. Um, I checked in with Principal Leiden earlier, it's gone well. Um, there's approximately 50 to 60 students in the satellite classrooms. You break that out by grade, it's probably about 19 in grade five, 12 in grade six, 15 in grade seven, 12 in grade eight. And when we talk about satellite rooms, those are where people are in school, but they're not in their actual classroom because their classroom right now cannot fit uh, with the spacing requirements, but they are able to still um, zoom into the class and access the class remotely. They are able to join their classmates during lunch. They are able to join their classmates at the outside breaks. Uh, these rooms are supervised um, for that. I think originally um, in talking with Principal Leiden, she was looking at uh, having those kids stay there until after the April vacation in the satellite rooms and then try to integrate them in a rotating basis. But after today and today went so well, that they're comfortable that they can even get some more numbers into place to be able to move those people in and not have to wait until after April vacation. They can start that as early as next Monday as they start to be able to move people in and then also develop a rotation system so that uh, if those people still have to access the um, uh, satellite rooms. So overall things went well. Um, for that, um, there are some challenges, uh, obviously staffing and coverage uh, there in order for this to happen that we've also have to displace a lot of staff and move them on to mobile carts to move around um, with that. We're still also very worried about positive cases and the impact that positive cases will have in terms of um, people having to be out to quarantine. With that, the data is still, as much as the data lately has been trending where there's more younger people uh, coming down with COVID, the data still supports that there's no uh, school transmissions uh, taking place. So uh, obviously we wanna continue with those protocols and procedures that are in place. We did receive word last week uh, from the Maine Department of Education that when it comes to classroom quarantining, Okay, so one of the things that um, has happened in a classroom, if there is one person who was in a classroom for more than 15 minutes and uh, they were uh, positive, that would mean the whole class, including the teacher, would have to quarantine. 
Uh, the DOE came out with guidance recently to say that if classrooms do have um, assigned seating, so if you have people that are in assigned seats, rather than take down the whole class to quarantine, uh, it would then be limited to the uh, perimeter of that person um, or to the positive case. So that's something that we're gonna be getting information out to our staff uh, soon to be able to encourage the um, assigned seating to be able to help that um, for it. There is right now, uh, we've ha we have had to expand uh, with more people coming back, it sometimes takes longer to get in the building. It sometimes takes longer to dismiss in the afternoon. There are some additional lunch duties. So uh, that is a concern that we've had to expand our duties uh, to come back and um, be able to get the supervision, the coverage that we need. We did, uh, since our last school committee meeting, uh, we did have a situation where there were positive cases that impacted the company that we contract with for our busing. And so that was a situation where between the positive cases in the COVID in the um, close contacts and the quarantining, we were worried that uh, that was gonna be a situation where we might have to shut down our schools. Uh, but Steve Boussier and um, the uh, Ledgemere um, management worked hard. Uh, to adjust their schedules. Uh, we had to uh, eliminate some of the runs that we had at the middle school and high school and asked that those kids either go full remote or find their uh, a, a way to school on those particular days. Uh, and there were some elementary runs that we had to delay uh, so that we could be able to make that happen. But we were able to do that, minimize the impact. We were able to get those bus drivers tested uh, and through uh, the proper procedures to be able to allow them essential workers to come out of quarantine. So we were able to um, dodge that particular issue. I still worry uh, that as uh, for right now that when we do have positive cases, that the, depending on what the quarantine, there could be an impact. So we are um, uh, making it work. It is happening. A big credit to our families. Uh, and our students for all of their patience, a big credit to our staff and our teachers for being able to work through this. Uh, also to our administration for all of their working through having to make this happen. So I still count us day to day, uh, but right now, um, all things considered, we've been able to accommodate those. Right now, it's just continuing to make sure that we don't have any positive cases. Any questions on our, our uh, return or our expansion of in-person learning? Uh, so that's excellent news to hear about the DOE's um, conversation about the classroom quarantining changing with the assigned seats and all that. Will that also um, positively impact the buses in the sense that um, let's just say one student or the, another bus driver becomes positive. The people that were past six feet from them will not need to quarantine. Yeah, so that hasn't been in play all along, um, Amy. That's been something that for a busing, you do have to wait for the 15 minutes, but you can um, look at that more on an individual basis. The way we have it set up for the drivers and people away from them, we have been able to kind of get by on that particular case as long as they haven't been the actual close contact um, yeah. for that. Steve, I don't know if you want to uh, jump in with anything there. Busing right now, the, their DOE is quick to point out that those are not guidelines. They're only recommendations that you have um, for that. So yeah, we when it comes to a busing situation, those are things that look like on an individual basis. And I think it is going to work out because on our buses, many of them do have assigned seating. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add with that, Matt, is with buses, you know, if we have our windows open, if there's no one sitting directly behind the driver, and the driver does not need to quarantine. And then the, on a lot of our buses um, up until now, that we've had a lot of space in between students. So we have not had to quarantine an entire bus uh, very often because we have had some space between students and having a seating chart, knowing where kids are sitting and who they were sitting around. 
um, we've been able to um, avoid having to quarantine whole buses. But it's something that um, Ledgemere is they're in a good spot today, uh, but it was really rocky uh, over the past couple of weeks as they worked through some quarantining things um, in their department. And um, hopefully we'll be on the right track here. While we're on the subject of transportation, um, they're now working on filling the transportation needs of the athletic department um, this spring as we look towards athletic events. Um, so Gordy has looked to have games uh, held on Saturdays and Wednesdays. Um, where busing will not be an issue um, and later um, games when possible um, during the week and uh, Ledgemere has just started that process of um, securing transportation but we're working through that. Um, anything else, Amy? No, I just think it's awesome because I think that this is going to really help much less, you know, the, the, the amount of kids needing to quarantine like at, for instance, the high school last week, you know, for one case, this is going to really be beneficial to not having somebody that potentially will need to be home. Yeah, that's definitely right. moving in the right direction. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, and some of that is in response to what's going on, right? They're evaluating the data. They're going in and seeing how we've done. Uh, so that's something that right now uh, they've, uh, communicated with their nurses at the Department of Education. And so that's where the direction's headed. So we will, uh, once that's finalized and their SOPs are updated, then that's when we're gonna announce it with our staff and encourage everyone to try to work on getting the um, assigned seating because that's gonna be where the key is because anything over 15 minutes still leads to that, depending on how close you are, still leads to that quarantine. Uh, do you have some, Paul? Yeah, I just had a, a quick question. I've read um, two articles, and I, I wanted to pull them up, but I don't have any uh, Wi-Fi connection on my phone right now. Two articles that have been debating the topic of, you know, three feet versus six feet, and does it actually make a difference? And so I was wondering if there has been any discussion about maybe lifting those um, requirements at all. Yeah, the, uh, Paula, that's where the major discussion has been because as everyone tries to get kids back to school more and increase that learning, that is absolutely the one of the biggest issues is that uh, spacing requirement of three to six feet. Right. And so right now, uh, that has been something that has been pushed by a lot of the schools. It's been pushed by um, school committees and superintendents and the public. And as of right now, the Department of Education does not plan to change that. Uh, the only way they would change that, it looks like, is whether or not the CDC comes back and really makes that change. And so the message that we received as superintendents last Friday was, is we are looking ahead next year uh, with the ESSER funds that we received from the American Recovery Act, uh, the American Recovery Plan Act, we need to uh, work on getting our kids back to school. And we're doing that with the understanding that those spacing guidelines are still going to be in place. Uh, then in the event that they are changed or lifted, that's always looked as a positive. But right now we are proceeding ahead with the idea that as of now, there are no plans for that. Could it change? Sure. But as of right now, the answer is no. Yeah. Anything else on COVID-19? Okay. Okay, let's move on, Matt, to the uh, donation for Ocean State Job Lot. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to recognize uh, Ocean State Job Lots right here in Sanford. As part of their Helping Communities initiative, uh, they recently donated um, 80 boxes of PPE uh, to the Sanford School Department. That PPE included gloves, shields, face masks, hand sanitizers, um, so obviously that's needed. We put that to good use. So a big thank you to Ocean State Job Lots right here in Sanford. Huge thank you. That was very nice of them. Okay, now everyone's been waiting for this part now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. So one of the things we started at the last meeting uh, based on suggestion of the school committee was 
uh, rather than always talking about uh, construction in COVID-19 and all those exciting things, we were able to also wanna make sure that uh, we still continue the neat uh, things that are happening in our schools. And so we started that last week. I wanna thank Liz Dudgeon uh, for helping uh, put together um, in a format right here of a, um, uh, a slideshow. We're gonna have this uh, accessible on our website. We're also working on ways to be able to get this pushed out through our app to people, uh, similar to some of those uh, newsletters that were done years ago, so that we can continue to kind of point these things out. Many of these things do come from individual newsletters that our schools do, uh, but still uh, pretty neat. So I'll start at the high school. We had our student representatives highlight uh, a number of uh, cool things happening there. Uh, work of our civil rights team in the spring musical, but also want to recognize that Samantha Hebert of a senior in the class of 2021 has been selected to receive the 2021 principals award. Uh, this award is sponsored, sponsored by the Maine principals association and it's given in recognition of high school seniors academic excellence outstanding school citizenship citizenship and uh, leadership uh, for that. Um, some of the quotes that came from the news release on that Samantha is a great example of a student who never quits when times get rough. Perseverance and persistence will serve her well in the future. Even with a mask, she's always smiling, according to uh, Principal Peterman, and she's a positive role model for our students. So uh, part of that is um, where uh, there's a senior from all high schools in the state um, for that, and they'll be invited, uh, Samantha will be invited to participate in the Principal's Award Live Virtual Scholarship Drawing Event which happens on Friday, May 14th. And that's where they'll draw 10 uh, 1,000 um, scholarship, uh, $1, uh, scholarships. So there we go. There's Samantha smiling behind her mask uh, with Principal Peterman. Uh, also, uh, high school wants to thank Project Graduation. Um, for the class of 2021. They've been coming to the high school every month to provide goodies for the seniors and a little pick me up through these uh, tough times for their upcoming graduation on um, June uh, 9th. There's a picture, uh, thank you, Project Grad. And then uh, SRTC, uh, Bath Ironworks presented their career opportunities uh, virtually to many of the SRTC programs in the um, uh, STEM pathway uh, back on Wednesday, March 17th. Uh, they also were able to work in a presentation from uh, Southern Maine Community College about their three week paid training programs in both welding and manufacturing, um, which um, also um, offer a guaranteed uh, BIW Bath Ironworks job interview. Uh, upon uh, completion. So uh, pretty neat there. And Skills USA at SRTC is going virtual. Uh, the state of Maine uh, competition uh, will be held virtually this year. It's happening this week. Students are participating from the following programs of automotive collision, repair, um, electricity, fire science, and video production. And in addition, um, in addition, a student will represent SRTC in the prepared speech contest as well. So uh, we've got 15 students participating. Want to wish them luck this week. Sanford Middle School. Um, there are a couple of amazing young ladies there on the screen at the middle school. Want to make an impact on the school and bring awareness to a cause. So they came up with a great plan that the middle school is implementing. So a big a shout out to Natalie and Shakiro. And uh, each student in their school is going to have uh, an opportunity to plant a flower seed, which will germinate and grow in the new uh, Sanford Middle School greenhouse. And this is to celebrate mental health awareness. Each class will be able to plant their flowers in various designated areas around the school next month. And growing flowers from seeds represents getting help and bringing attention to mental health to help crush the stigma and the flowers represent strength, diversity, and resiliency.
Uh, also this past year uh, in the fifth grade, one second here. Uh, each fifth grade classroom has participated in a biweekly social emotional program that has been facilitated by Bree. You see a picture of Bree here, the Animal Welfare Society's humane educator. Students have met virtually with snakes, cats, and other animals while learning about social emotional learning topics, including diversity and empathy. Grade students just wrapped up, grade six students just wrapped up two March Madness tournaments. One determined the top supreme scientists of all times, and the other was a double elimination math basketball tournament. Uh, students are getting excited uh, to write to pen pals in Pakistan to coincide with the read aloud of I am Malala and learning about culture in social studies. Um, We'll probably, we might hear more about this later. Uh, Soul Hope, uh, the JMG Jobs Remains Graduate Program at the middle school partnered with Tara Pierce of Soul Hope to help her, her God, Ugandans students per, work to create parts of denim shoes that prevent infections in the feet of villagers. Shoes can have an incredible lasting impact on Ugandan villages, enabling people to get their families work in school and people can visit Soul Hope soulhope.org for more information on how to get involved. At Carl J. Lamb School, Mrs. Gillis's um, second grade students wrote letters and mailed Flat Stanley, uh, plus carded him all around town so that they could read and write about his many adventures. Flat Stanley visited the Dollar Tree with second grader Cash Letourneau, as you see a picture here. And then uh, also on the screen is a picture of Mrs. Cindy Smith, the final winner of CGL's PTA's March into Madness raffle. Raffle items were donated as random acts of kindness to staff members by our generous Sanford community. This was a ray of sunshine in the long days of March and very much appreciated. And then at Margaret Chase Smith School, they also had their March Madness um, our, which was an opportunity to listen to 16 different books read by 16 different staff members. And then they placed the books into two uh, brackets, much like the NCA March Madness Tournament. And then students got to vote for their favorite book in a head-to-head -head contest. And uh, students voted each day this week until they determined a winner. And there's our uh, winner. Right there, as you can kind of see the brackets in the screening. And then uh, Pratt and Whitney last Friday, uh, their fourth grade students had the opportunity to Zoom with an engineer from Pratt and Whitney. The engineer had the students participate in an experiment with magnets as they learned about the power of magne magnetism and how it can be used to create electricity. And then at MCS Attendance Heroes, to encourage students who are improving their daily attendance, MCS has started to recognize individual students each morning during announcements. And uh, that's an acronym, a hero is someone who is here every day, ready to learn and on time. There's a picture of some of our heroes at MCS. And then at Willard School, uh, there's a picture of Sanford's Reed Dogs, uh, Dodger, Ori, and Willow. The Reed Dog program at Willard started um, in January of 2021 with six participants. And they now see nine students throughout the day, and all participants have shown an increase in their fluency and accuracy. One student started in January at a reading level C and is now in March performing 98% accuracy at an E. There's some pictures of the students enjoying the read dogs. Their students have increased their ability to read out loud and have become more confident in their reading. Many of the readers report that they're reading at home with their own dogs now because they realize that dogs appreciate the attention. And the students report that they look forward to reading to the dogs. They feel more comfortable with the dogs. They're learning to be more comfortable with the teachers who are present with the dogs. And the Reed dogs provide an anxiety reducing, stress relieving, calming factor in many of 
the at-risk students' days. They enhance and improve communi communication skills as students are encouraged to discuss their read aloud with their reading partners. Some days reading takes a backseat to social emotional needs. And once those needs are met, they jump right back in and get back reading again. There's been a lot of success and growth with the Read Dogs at Willard School, and they hope to continue next year and, include, and to include more students. COVID-19 has complicated things a bit, but they're working out the kinks, and their goal is to create a functional and beneficial program that is influential to those students who are involved. And that is um, some positive good news of things happening on our school. As I mentioned, that's something we'd like to put onto our website and also be able to push that out to people as well to share all the positive news. Excellent, good work, Matt. Is it everything you thought it would be, Amy? I love it. <laughs> that's awesome. I love the read dogs. Yeah, and I think Matt, that's that awesome. Is, is that a national program or is that a local program? What is the read? Give me some yeah, it's, it, Well, it's it's local model. It's the one we have right here in, in Sanford, John, but it is modeled after other best practices as well um throughout the country have we been doing it or is this the first year we were doing that in the past pre-covid but with covid we kind of uh took a slowed it down and now we've kind of ramped it back up because it's uh as you can see it's uh it's popular and it's also effective well thank you for sharing that i had no knowledge that's just a great program Adam. awesome okay is that everything you got for that matt it is yep okay then we'll move on to the director's reports and we have the JMG presentation right off at the top. So I think this is another thing everybody's been waiting for tonight. Well, yeah, I'd that? like to I'd like to recognize our uh, two JM uh, Jobs Remain graduate teachers we have right here in Sanford at Sanford High School, Cheryl Gifford, and at uh, Sanford Middle School, Tara Hull. Take it Thanks. away, please. All right, I'm going to share my screen, Matt. So thank you so much for having us. Um, I, I, I too loved those uh, read dogs. I, I want to see how we can get that to the high school, Mr. Peterman. Those are those are exciting. Um, but thank you so much for having us today and giving us this opportunity to talk about um, JMG. Tara and I could talk about JMG for hours, but we will keep it uh, try to keep it down to ten minutes. Uh, we also want to welcome our manager Jess Ward, who is also on this call with us today as well. There you go. Um, so JMG is the only nonprofit in Maine that offers a continuum of support for our students starting in middle school through high school and college and beyond into their careers. When students graduate from Stanford High School, I follow up with them every month for a year and generally beyond that. But within that year, I am looking to still be their support system looking to help them find a job if they need that or a reference or a resume or really whatever they need, even if it's social, emotional. So our support does not stop at graduation, but goes beyond that. JMG is student-centered and student-led, so the program is always inspired by student ideas and interests and is many opportunities that they have to step into leadership roles in the projects that we do. And the data shows that Stanford JMG students improve their attendance, they increase their behavior referrals to admin, increase their GPA, and the Stanford High School program has over a 90% graduation rate. Also, in addition to that, JMG is unique because we have partnerships with over 500 main businesses and resources. These businesses specifically partner with JMG because of the high quality employees that leave our programs. And in some cases, the JMG students are actually treated with priority to be hired um, because of the reputation JMG students have within those businesses and companies as incredible employees. Also, colleges partner with JMG. We have a number of main colleges that have JMG specialists right on campus to welcome the JMG students as they leave high school and enter college. And those JMG specialists uh, help with retainment, recruitment, and also help keep freshmen in school. So some of the areas that we focus on in middle school and high school are listed here and I'll, I'll read off 
a few of them. Uh, we work on self-esteem and confidence and character building, job attainment, career exploration, informational interviews. Our students go out and do job shadows. Uh, leadership is a big one for us, financial literacy. We're really looking to connect our students to our school and our community social emotional development. And we also have several guest speakers come in each year to talk about their careers, um, barriers or um, social emotional. We do business tours and college tours as well. We as JMG specialists, of, is a, we are of course educators. Um, in addition to that, we are mentors, supporters and advocates for our students. This is a picture of uh, myself and two of my students when we were on the awesome Ashley show last year. This is on the Biddeford Public Access TV. Awesome Ashley um, had come into Sanford High School to talk to my students about barriers and overcoming those barriers. She hosts this program and invited us to come talk about Sanford High School and JMG. So it was a great opportunity for our students. Sorry. <laughs> so because JMG is centered around the students, this presentation wouldn't be complete without hearing from them, um, students past and present, and also a JMG parents. Just give me one second to switch over here. JMG means to me, a class where you can get help with your work, to become a leader, a better person, and to help others in need. So JMG has helped me because I feel like I found my leadership and the skills that I need to be confident in myself and to succeed. Hello, my name is Valerie Randall and I'm a freshman and this is my third year in JMG. What JMG means to me, it helps you become more organized. It helps you have a career when you haven't even graduated. You work on community service, projects and it helps you come out of your comfort zone. You help so many people that need it. And this class is like my second family. JMG is, is an amazing program and I love it so much. My family and my parents love it because there is a new positive girl that is willing to do and try anything new. My name is Garrett Lee. I'm a senior at Stanford High and this is my third year in JMG. JMG means many things to a lot of students across Maine. But to me, it means things such as support, communication, productivity, and positive environments. I made JMG my first block so it would motivate me to go to school more and I wouldn't be where I am today without it. Thank you. JMG for me has been my lifeline to being a successful young adult. It helps me to break out of the norms of what my community is and really become an adult that I am proud to be. Um, JMG was different from any other class that I had taken. The teachers really cared about you. You really felt valued and they pushed you to be the best that you could possibly be. Without that, I don't know where I would have been today. Um, about a few months ago, Ms. Gifford reached out to me about an uh, opening here at Kenny Bunk Savings and I have been in this position for eight months now. I truly hope that the kids and the teens in the near future have these same opportunities that I was given through JMG. Hi, my name is Amy Bulldog, and I am the mother of Haley and Jordan Bulldog. Both have been attending JMG since they were in seventh grade. I feel that JMG is very important because it has created a very huge self-confidence for both my daughters from being able to help people by volunteering, raising money for families, and helping those less fortunate. I also feel that the motivation and the goal-centered planning for it and figuring out where they're going to go in their future and what they want to do and what their passion is, is critical. I think being a teenager, junior high, high school can be tough and JMG has definitely helped support my daughters. I'm going to switch back over here. Here we go. 
All right. And then we have one more quote from a JMG student that wasn't able to do a video, but she graduated in 2018 from Sanford High and had been in JMG for five years at the time. And at the end of each JMG year we have or semester, we have a closing ceremony. It's a huge celebration of our students. And actually, Mr. Nelson has been able to come to a couple in Mr. Bouzier. Um, and so this student uh, did a speech during the closing ceremony. And this is an excerpt from that. This is Madison. She said, JMG is not just a class, it's a family. We're not in, just in JMG for a semester or a year. I've been in JMG for five years and I have the opportunity to stay with JMG for the rest of my life. I met the president of JMG and that's what he said. It's something to be a part of that's bigger than just me. We do so much good and I've learned things I will use for the rest of my life. My specialists really care about me even when I felt like no one else did. They made time for me when no one else did. JMG is the reason I came to school. It's the reason I graduated. JMG is the reason I have a job right now. There's no way I would be where I am without JMG and the specialists, and they're even still checking on me. Thank you, JMG. So um, other areas that we work on, uh, as I mentioned before, having guest speakers and going to conferences, leadership conferences, we try to do that a few times a year. Obviously this year with COVID, we weren't able to, but we were able to do some online business tours and civic awareness. Sort of at the bottom, you can see, bottom right, you can see a couple of our students uh, were professionally dressed as we teach them. And we went to the State House and got to mingle a little bit with the representatives there and talk about JMG, which was a great experience for them. At the middle school level, we really focus on engaging the students with hands-on community-based projects and getting them connected to positive members of our community and in our, within our school. And this has been hugely beneficial to students because some of those connections have gone beyond just when they're in middle school. They've gone on to work for these people at their businesses. They've gone on to volunteer with these adults that they've met, <clears throat> such as Wanda Parent um, and even some volunteer work with Emily Sheffield. So that's been huge. And what you see here is that all these ideas in these pictures um, were student led or inspired. We have Soul Hope up in the upper left. We have our school food drive, Haunted Woods, um, leadership summits that they've been going, going to to get inspiration from. It's actually where Shakira, um, Linto and Natalie Kane, the people you saw earlier with the garden, the flower garden project, um, the Mayan conference is where that was inspired from this year from the virtual version of that conference uh, in November. Um, and, and no idea that students come up with are turned down, even the crazy ones like wanting to hang 1500 lanterns around Gowen Park in the middle of COVID. Um, special thank you to Mr. Nelson and Mr. Boussier for even entertaining that idea, which ended up being outstanding and will definitely be done again. So as students move on to high school, the focus starts to be preparing them more for life after high school. So when we're working on career development, job readiness skills, soft skills, but we still do play an important part in our community and still give back. And here are some of the activities that we do in high school, Toys for Tots, Day of Caring. The students started Special Olympics bowling last year at Bolarama and we'll pick that up next year as well. But um, Special Olympians from age 14 to 56 came and bowled for the day at, like I mentioned, Bolorama. And this year, the students came up with projects to do um, during COVID, which was they did over 150 Valentine cards for local nursing homes and Project Linus, which is making blankets for hospitalized children. And to spread a little holiday cheer, we lined our driveway with these happy holiday um, lollipop signs. And um, uh, we'll hopefully do that again next year as well. That was really well received. And we brought a special guest with us to show how our partnerships within the school and also the community benefit our students. I'd like to introduce Brent Coleman, our outreach worker. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, so um, I'm really excited and I'm super honored to be here to highlight um, the amazing work that JMG does and the, uh, the work that Tara and Cheryl have done uh, for our students and our community. Um, 
So thanks for having me. Uh, so as an outreach worker, I, I work to, and aim to connect students and families to a multitude of resources. And uh, JMG is one of these amazing resources I utilize at the middle school and the high school uh, for, for some of my students. Um, and JMG plays an integral part in not only the work I do, but the work our school social workers do, our school counselors, teachers, administrators. Uh, we all aim um, and work with JMG to enrich our students with a great education, uh, healthy activities, life skills, uh, and, and to connect them with healthy adults. And this connectedness is huge in the prevention work and, and uh, decreasing or avoiding risk of behaviors in the future um, and really sets students up for success and gives them a sense of pride in, in what they're doing for their community and for themselves in the long run. Um, and uh, over the years, it has it's been awesome to witness um, uh, our JMG teachers um, and the amazing job they're doing preparing our students uh, to be successful in school, at home, in their community, and beyond school. And um, they do this by giving them the skills they need to do so uh, and, and giving them the opportunities to have these connections with so many, not just in Sanford, but beyond. I mean, I've gone on a couple of trips uh, in the past and they've been fun. They've been, it's been great to see how these kids have learned so much and, and what they're gaining. Um, but one, of, one most important thing, because I've had the opportunity to, to work in Sanford and with the Sanford School Department uh, close to eight years, and uh, I've been able to witness how this comes back full circle. Because a lot of the students, not only I've connected with JMG, but a lot of the kids that, that have gone through the program are coming back. And they're connecting with students as mentors, volunteers, um, and, and really reinforcing with the kids what they're doing for themselves uh, and, and what their, uh, the possibilities of what they could do for other people. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Tara and Cheryl, and I think it's Jess. I don't know if we've met, um, but all the JMG programs out there that what they're doing for these kids, because we're seeing the results and um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak on our behalf as well. And thank you, um, Mr. Nelson and the board. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come talk about a program that we love so much and for continuing, continuing our partnership. We've been at Sanford High School, Sanford for uh, 16 years. And so um, thank you for that. Excellent. Do we have uh, questions? Anyone? Other than you're amazing. Thank yeah, you no, so much. <laughs> we'll take that. We'll take that. <laughs> thank you so much. One of the one of the things I love about the Jaws for Maine graduate program is when they talk their talk here, you see it in action. It is student centered. That is, uh, when you go to their different activities, uh, you know, uh, Tara and, and um, Cheryl, they're integral, but this is their, it's not their complete show. The kids are owning it. And when you see that, that's magical. And when you, and right along with that is when you see kids have that uh, involvement and that ownership, what you see is confidence. And you can just see the confidence uh, of kids from that, and that's um, you know, I, um, I I think that's awesome. I think that's just great work, and that's really when it comes back to what education is all about. When we can see kids involved and kids confident, kudos. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, how many students are involved? Did you say that total in, in our community? So I have about 50 a year and hoping to be able to up that now that I have a larger classroom at the new um, middle school. And I have between 80 and 85 a year. Okay. There are, um, there are some schools around the state that do have multiple specialists at the high school level and uh, multiple at the middle school level too, to be able to even fit more students. <laughs> so you have oh, some, some great achievements, and I would imagine that there are students uh, not involved with JMG that have maybe equal strengths because of maybe family support and so forth. But, you know, in, in my dream world, as I sit here as a school committee member, I would love all students to have those types of opportunities and end results as we give them a diploma. H how do we get more students involved? 
Um, I, yeah, I have too many questions for tonight, but. <laughs> That's a good question. More <laughs> specialists. <laughs> I mean, you just need to have more specialists, which I am trying to advocate for, so. Yeah, so along those lines, do you have a number of students that want to be in JMG, but can't because you don't have the bandwidth? Yes, yes we do. We, have, we both have quite the wait lists. Yeah, okay. I take way more students than, um, than allotted because I too feel like everyone should, should have this program. And so we get lots of recommendations from teachers and friends and counselors every year. And, um, you know, we do the best that we can, but yes, there is a need for more, for sure. Has this wait list been going on for more than one, a couple of years? Or is this something new? No, it's been, we always have like a certain number that we can just physically fit in our rooms and also according to our JMG ratios because we want to provide the right support for these students and the right environment for them. Um, so JMG has their own kind of suggestions for the ratio, but no, we, I think we have a wait list every year, right, Cheryl? Yes. I think looking at the school board members in this room, I think you're on their radar. <laughs> It's, 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 no, I don't want to call it the basics, right? What, what, you, what you're sharing with those students, as well as, and it's not my, my, one of my pet projects, not project, but drivers through personal finance, but it's the basics in life that, that yeah. you're teaching. And I would love to, and I'll probably, you know, get, anyway, all of these kinds of comments, but so what can we take off the plate within public education so we can put more of this on the plate? Because, <laughs> This is the stuff that society needs. So thank you for that. And yeah, I think John and John are right. We, we, we need more of this. So. Well, the only thing we didn't say too is that we invite you at any point into our classroom, you know, for, virtually this year, if it must, but um, we certainly love to have you in um, anytime to see more. Yeah, you can be involved, like any of you can be involved with any of our projects at any time. We'd love to have people involved. Uh, the more positive community member role models and connections these students can make. Um, it's been so beneficial with everyone who's participated in any of our projects for our students to meet and uh, connect with. Um, Thank you. I can, sorry, no, can I just ask a, a clarification question? You see at uh, 50 students this year, was that at the high school or at the middle school? Middle school, uh, because I have my students for the full year, so I, yeah, that's I have four blocks, which is the most I can have given our schedule, and then my blocks are with COVID full. <laughs> yeah. Out of curiosity, um, the other um, school districts in Sanford, do any other districts um, have two in the high school setting or two in the middle school setting, or is it typically one JMG specialist in both schools? So great. Portland has, is it three or four, Cheryl? Three at Portland High School? Three there, three in Waterville, the larger schools. Yeah, three in, in Wyndham, I think, possibly four in Lewiston. Just can speak up if I'm wrong there. Report um, has. Report has. Right. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yes. We can hear yes. you, Jill. Yeah, so we, yeah. we do have. we. Yeah, we have multiple specialists um, in high schools and middle schools. We also have some high school completion programs, which is sort of a. The high school completion programs are the, the senior specialists, right, Cheryl? The high school com uh, completion is for um, dropout recovery. Oh, that's right. Yep. So dropout. So they, they changed it, the name to high school completion, meaning for those students that have dropped out of high school to have them come back and um, try to get them to graduate, which is not necessarily JMG students. It's throughout the school. It's a JMG program. Um, so that might be a, something of interest as well at Sanford. Um, I think Jess got bumped out. She lost her power at home and she drove to a nearby, I think gas station to try to steal internet to be on this. So that's why her connection is bad. Nice. There's some dedication there. <laughs> That's a, just some more JMD dedication for you. <laughs> All 
I would love to help you advocate just in a sense when I think about Lewiston, I feel like our numbers are not that off from Lewiston High and Waterville, and they have three at their high school. So that'd be great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. What is the dog? Watching the kids reading with the dogs, I do yeah. appreciate it. Well, that's that's some high praise right there. Yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> that means a lot. Of I do say a bit. I say better, but okay. <laughs> hey, thanks for thanks thanks for taking the time and presenting. And I think you've uh, opened up probably a whole can of worms with a bunch more questions. So, <laughs> well, anytime, let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, let's move on then. Let's go on to assistant superintendent. Uh, Steve, what do you got for us tonight? Oh, good evening. I have a, a short report tonight. I um, want to update you first on our remote food distribution for our remote learners. Since September, we have been providing remote meal distributions Monday through Friday at the public entrance of Sanford High School and over at Lafayette School as well. Um, in addition, we've been serving remote meals on um, Wednesdays through our bus routes. Um, as we have brought students back four days a week, we have seen a natural increase in the amount of meals that are being served in our school buildings um, and a dramatic decrease in the number of meals that are being served at these remote sites. Um, and looking at the numbers in staffing, um, we have made the decision to close Lafayette school site starting today. Um, Holly looked at the number of families that were using that Lafayette school site and the seven families that were using that site consistently. Um, they were all driving to Lafayette and so they are all able to drive over to the high school. Um, so we're continuing with that high school location for pickup um, meals. In addition to that over at the high school, we are also providing um, meals to some daycares in town. If you remember, we are an open site and can provide free meals to from birth um, all the way up to age 18. Just to give you some numbers, um, we have a private daycare on Elm Street where we're serving 45 meals, Curtis Lake Church, 50 meals, the YMCA, we're serving 25 meals, and at the Nassau Community Center, we're serving 25 lunches um, as well. And if you're wondering what our bus distribution is on Wednesdays, we are serving about 500 meals um, on Wednesdays. So that is a significant number of meals going out in our community. So, but with Kids Back, Holly reports that we're seeing a, you know, a dramatic increase in those uh, lunch and breakfast numbers. We did have our annual March uh, safety committee meeting this afternoon. Um, we had six accidents reported from staff over the month of March and none of those resulted in lost time. Um, we had four strip, slip trips and falls. Um, one of those occurred over at CGL as you walk down from the upper parking lot into the building um, and the maintenance staff have installed a railing that should help and support um, incidents like this from happening in the future. And now we just got to get the crack taken care of. But um, we also had one collapsed chair and then one hand that was closed in the door. Um, part of our safety committee when we meet monthly is the schools report out on any issues they may be having in regards to safety. Um, sometimes these issues are minor issues that we can take care of rather quickly and some of them are more long term um, where we need to they need to go through the budget process. But just to give you an idea of what uh, some of the projects that were completed just the last month at MCS we had an AED machine that was installed in the gym entrance. Um, we had an intercom that was installed at the Sanford Middle School. Um, when we moved in that facility, we did not have an intercom for the gymnasium, and so that has been installed. And then the stairs at the back school, at Woods School, they had a crack in them, and that crack has been taken care of. And those just a, a few examples of some of the things that were brought to our attention and um, were handled. Um, on the student side of things, we continue the good report. Um, we've had no accidents year to date um, on the student side of things, so that's good news. I want to give you an update tonight on summer programming. Um, Beth Lambert has been instrumental as we begin um, our process of developing summer programming for kids. As we look ahead to summer programming, we're really uh, coming at it from a lens of providing options, providing options for, for families and options for students. Um, 
so the planning is underway and next week I have a meeting with a variety of stakeholders to talk about the summer facility use in our buildings, um, which includes school staff, the recreation department, school nutrition, and the maintenance. Um, we have hired for some of our traditional summer programming. We've hired for Title I, and Title I is a reading and math intervention for students in grades K through four, and that will take place eight to 12 daily. We've hired for Jumpstart, and Jumpstart is a program that will provide literacy intervention for our incoming kindergarten students. And Tammy Delaney has done a great job in getting out ahead of it um, and hiring for our extended school year. And extended school year is for those identified special education students in grades K through 12. These programs will begin uh, the day after July 4th on July 5th. Title I and ESA, ESY are four day week programs. They'll run Monday through Thursday and they run up until July 29th. And then Jumpstart is Monday through Friday and they run a week longer um, due to the nature of the program and they will run up until August 6th. With all of these programs, transportation, breakfast and lunch will be provided um, to students. Um, so far, so good on the hiring front um, with staff. We have a few holes left to fill, um, but we're, we're pleased with what we have so far. We have started conversations with the rec department. Um, the rec department uses our facility for their day programs. Usually they use two of our facilities and they service students in grades K to six. Um, we are looking um, with some of our federal funds to hire a couple of teachers to work in their programs um, for a portion of the day and really to their goal is going to be to create engaging learning opportunities for students in the areas of math, literacy, science, art, and music. Um, in addition to having uh, classroom teachers, we are also have reached out to our music and art folks to see if they would also like to participate in offering some type of um, programming for these kids in a fun way over the summer um, with that, we have created the job descriptions and we're working the rec department to hope to get those posted rather soon. At this point, I'm gonna let Beth take over and talk about some of the other things we've discussed. Beth? All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so what I've been working on is sort of gathering the multiple pieces for the different pathways that um, parents and students can take. Um, so that might be, um, I've actually worked with the librarians and K to 12, the librarians are going to come up with um, themes through the summer. Um, maybe the first one is around 4th of July, they'll do read alouds, they'll find interactive um, activities online that the kids that might not be going to a summer camp but want to do something and maybe have be read to have an activity. Um, and so they're going to do that. So it's grade specific. Um, even the high school, she's going to do kind of like sneak peeks for novels and read the first few pages of the first chapter to try to get them hooked. Um, and so that will be able to access through their school technology. Um, I have reached out the, we do have one of our um, elementary music teachers who's very interested and excited, already has some ideas of what we could do um, as part of that interactive program with the rec department. Um, and what we'd like to do with those teachers um, when we hire them is for them to create themes as well. So that um, each week the kids have something to look forward to. Lori Hegarty was saying that she was hoping to be able to do seven field trips with those kids this year. So the idea is that the teachers will do sort of some front loading fun projects to get the kids really excited into where they're going so that everything kind of flows together and they have a, a common experience that they can continue to then have conversations and, and uh, learn and discuss. Um, and right now I'm working on an, um, an interactive platform that I'm hoping maybe I can share with you guys next time that has more specific information about each of the different grade levels and offerings that we have um, with um, live read alouds. It, the librarians are going to start doing um, live read alouds at different areas where lunches are being delivered this summer. Um, and hint, hint, it doesn't have to be just librarians. You never know if I'll come knocking at your door asking if uh, you'd be a guest speaker for us. So just be forewarned. Um, and we were yeah, thinking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were also thinking it might be nice to find some wonderful high school students to come join us for read alouds because those littles just love when those big high school kids come and spend time with them. Great community service for those students, great opportunity to just kind of build 
community again um, and get people together. The kids can go grab their lunch, sit, eat it while they have a read aloud um, with some of their administrators, teachers, other people in the in the um, district. So that's kind of what we're looking at. I'm, I'm, as we're getting closer, I'm kind of getting a little more excited about it. Pieces are starting to come together. Um, and then, um, so that's kind of what we have planned for the students. And I'll have more specifics for you guys next time, I think. Um, we'll meet with Lori Hegarty and a couple of other players um, to kind of put some of the final pieces together. Um, and then this, I'm just going to follow into my my actual report. And Beth, yep, Beth, oh, absolutely. Beth, I'll check in a couple things. Mm -hmm. uh, along what Beth is saying, um, we are planning on our students to be able to retain their technology over the summer mm -hmm. rather than turn that in. That technology will be able to help people um, activate and access. Beth mentioned some of the other things that she's putting together for that. One of the things we're kind of looking at is like a menu opportunity that we send out that you, whether you're part of the rec program, whether you're part of Jumpstart, whether you're part of extended school year, whether you're on your own, whether you have your technology, what are those things you can do to access in those programs that you can also keep learning going. Uh, Kathy Sargent for SRTC is also looking at a um, middle school program for people in Sanford as well as ascending schools. That was something she shared last year with the school committee, but due to COVID, we really could only do that in one program, uh, the video production, but we're hoping to expand that. So what you're seeing is a lot of options, a lot of flexibility, and trying to be able to have that uh, opportunities and available for kids and families. Do you guys have any questions about that? That we share? It's a good teaser, Beth. You guys are all excited to hear all about it next time. Well, I wanted, I wanted to show tonight what I was working on, but I figured I'd wait a little bit. So yeah. <laughs> what did you have, Jonathan? Yeah, Matt, Matt, did you say that all devices will be left for students this summer? Yeah, that is our plan is that we're looking at is keeping that in their hands so that will be able to help over the summer. Well, that, that, that's, I was going to ask that. Um, Beth, it sounds like most of the programs are maybe for the younger age classes. Is that uh, early on in this year, I had asked about summer school and I was thinking more about well, all students. I always am, but we are. Yep, we are working on some of the older kids as well. I've worked with the band directors. I believe they're planning a week-long band camp. Um, they just sent me back some questions today that I need to get back to them with some answers. So that would be um, grades 6 through 12. They want to combine it, um, hopefully do it at the high school. Um, and I was going to work, I'm going to meet with Pam Lydon and some of her department chairs to see what they might like to offer with the middle school as well. Um, so yeah, we're, it's it, it's obviously easier to um, to find activities for the for the smaller kids, but I think the online components might be the way that we can help connect um, some of the older students. Um, and we're also doing a a book giveaway, so that every student before they leave school in June, um, if they're K to five, they'll they'll get two brand new books, one fiction and one nonfiction is our hope. And then for students grades six through 12, they'll each get a novel of their choice um, to help increase those, those community libraries, the libraries in the homes. And our other goal is periodically throughout the summer to have more of those book giveaways. It might be um, when lunch or breakfast is being given out. It might be when um, food distribution is happening, just moments where the community comes together that we can continue to grow um, those libraries around. Um, so those are some of the things that we're hoping um, you can do that K to 12. And I'm, I know when we start to put our heads together, we'll come up with a couple of more things, kind of hoping we can figure out something to do with the Performing Arts Center and maybe theater. Um, that's my next step. So I think that will be good. <clears throat> and Jonathan, and Amy, Amy's got a question. Sorry. You know, as you're talking, Beth, um, and, you know, we're just coming off this, like, um, awesome presentation from JMG. You know, has there ever been discussion around JMG doing summer programs for those middle school and high school students? Um, you know, that I just, I just see it being not that, 
Um, not that Tara and Cheryl want to work um, all summer, but it, I wonder, you know, kind of thinking about extending those programs. And I don't, maybe they do, and I just don't know it. That is a great um, suggestion, Amy. I don't know, but they'll be hearing from me first thing tomorrow morning, and I'll find out. That is a great idea. I was just going to mention that the other piece that we didn't mention is at the high school, they are planning on offering summer school um, they're in two sessions in the month of one when school gets out and another one in July. I think one of the things as we've been working through the, the program here, um, Beth has done a great job, but one of the concerns we, we have is staff and getting the staff to work during the summer after the year we've had. Um, so we'll keep our fingers crossed and we'll do what we can do. Um, with that. I was going to I was going to say some of the things that Steve did that the high school is going to have a credit recovery model, which is kind of your traditional uh, summer school. And our challenge through all of this is to make sure that just because it's summer learning doesn't mean there's a rule that says it can't be fun. And so that's where we're trying to look at existing things and trying to be creative to keep that learning going so that, you know, you're always going to run into um, a potential summer slide. And so that's where, uh, and we'll probably have a presentation for you later on, but right now it's still, there's still some loose ends. There's still some exciting energy and some ideas around that, that we can kind of firm up. And the key too, as Steve mentioned, is going to be the staffing. Our hope is that we can get out in front of that. We've uh, started advertising earlier than we ever have for extended school year and uh, Jumpstart and Title I. I think we've seen the benefit of that by getting out sooner um, for that. So that's why we continue to work to kind of flush this out and so that we can get word out to see if there are people who are interested in it. Matt, did you... Are your fellow uh, superintendents, are most districts offering some sort of summer school? They are. A lot of it is um, more of just intense intervention for those kids who really weren't connected much during the school year. That's really a primary focus. Uh, similar people connecting with their rec departments and trying to exist with that. That's something that is going on in other areas uh, as well um, for that. So that worry, though, um, when we talked about this at the uh, last Friday was that staffing issue. There is that concern that there's funds, there's ideas, but unless you have the people to execute those ideas, then um, so you've got to find that balance. You've got to be careful to be able to do that, that it doesn't overshoot too much. Um, that you can't follow through. So yeah, that was, and there are ongoing discussions as we kind of share what people are doing. Well, is there any restrictions to, I know teachers live in different districts as far as working here in Sanford, but there may be a teacher that doesn't want to travel this summer that might be willing to teach yep. algebra or something here. I just. Yep. And those, and we've done that in the past too. And that it, We'll we'll be able to get those postings, that information out where it won't be just limited to Sanford people. We're open to others. And you're right, there have been some others. And that's actually worked out as people have come to do that in the summer. And oh, by the way, they've enjoyed it. And then down the line, when positions have opened during the school year, they've looked at that. So yeah, there's no rule that says that we have to be limiting that. Um, it was, it was kind of, I, I was thinking along those lines too. So glad to hear that. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, we'll be looking forward to the uh, the more in depth presentation from Beth next time. So Beth, okay. you have uh, your regular uh, thing about professional development. I just wanted to follow up that we haven't just um, focused on the students for this summer. We've also um, focused on the teachers and what they need. So I sent out um, a Google form to administrators, to department chairs at the middle school and the high school to grade level leaders, K to five, as well as our math and literacy coaches, asking them what they feel is a need for professional development this summer. So I gathered information from all the parties involved um, and have compiled a list that I'll sit down with Matt and Steve um, to review everything from um, continued technology training to book studies, um, working with phonics, some social studies curriculum work this summer. 
Um, my goal is to keep everything in the month of August. I think it's really important that teachers kind of need a break when school gets out to kind of um, reset themselves. Um, and so we're on our way there and we should have that schedule um, ready to share out by the 1st of May. Thanks, and that's a really good point, Beth, that the uh, teachers need uh, stuff just as much as the kids at this point. So yep. glad to hear you doing that. Okay, anything else from Beth? Anybody? Okay, let's move on to new business. And Matt's already got off the, uh, the substitute here, so. Yeah, uh, hold on here. Okay, so um, we did uh, early in the year talk about adjusting substitute rates for teachers, and we've done that. And but uh, one thing we'd like to do in front of you today is to also look at changing our sub rates for uh, other areas and other positions in the school district beyond teachers and ed techs. And so specifically, we're looking at uh, nurse, uh, custodians, uh, administrative assistants, and maintenance. And so if you look at uh, what I have up on the screen um, for that, you will see um, what the uh, what is in uh, gold there uh, is um, what we're proposing it to be. And then you can see below that in red is what we're looking at, what the current rate is. So in terms of nursing substitutes, it's currently uh, $100 a day for an LPN, $125 for an RN. Uh, we'd like to increase that by $25 a day. So it'd be 125, 150. Custodians, it's currently $14 and $16 um, by experience. We'd like to change that to uh, a first shift experience at $17. No experience would be $15. And then for custodians at second shift, if they had an experience uh, for second shift, it'd be $17.30. And if it was no experience, that would be $15.30. Right now, as far as food service, that's, that is something that is right there in their per collect in their bargaining agreement. So that's something right now that we don't have the flexibility on. Administrative assistance was something that we've not had before, but with uh, COVID-19, that's something we have to look at. And so the current rate um, was um, $12. And we'd like to vary that for as far as both ex, uh, an experience rate of $16 and, uh, and no experience, it would be $14. And we would define experience in the, uh, around Sanford School Department administrative experience. Oftentimes you can see some of those people who are interested in coming back and plugging in and subbing for us. And then for um, uh, maintenance, and uh, grounds uh, crew, that would be, uh, it's currently 16 for experience, 14 with no experience. And we're looking to bump that up to $20 uh, experience and no experience 16. So this is something that we've worked at, at the central office level. Um, we met um, with our central office team to kind of look at uh, different things. And this is the proposal that we have in front of you this evening. Uh, for approval to kind of uh, raise up those substitute rates uh, beyond where we've been just with teachers and ed techs. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the substitute rates as presented. Do I have a second? Second from Ballin. Any discussion? It's, it's just a matter of market conditions, Matt. That's really what you're trying to do in order to lure um, to lower staff at all. Is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, exactly. It's not just a situation where we're talking COVID as well. That's an impact, but it's also, like you said, Jonathan, market conditions and keeping up with that. Yeah. Is it admin assistant, maybe a bit of backwards, isn't that a part of collective bargaining also? No, we've had something in there about when they can be used, but it was not something in there as far as what the rate was paid. Sometimes they tr traditionally fell into um, situations where it might be um, 
what the uh, teacher substitutes had, had received. And that we found out really isn't working um, as well as it should because it is specific skill sets you're talking about. Okay, so, so although we, in a second, I imagine this will get approved, but even in, uh, I'm going to scroll back down a little more if I get to see the titles. No, nope, other way. Sorry. Right. Scroll up, up, down. Food service is part of collective bargaining. So you'll be working with those bargaining units soon. So, correct. Okay. okay. All right. I'm good. Yeah, any other questions, comments? Anybody? Yeah, all in favor? All in favor. Those unanimous, Matt. Thank you. Uh, we're on to the February 21 financials with Cheryl. How are you this evening, Cheryl? Good. How are you guys? We're always good. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yep. Uh, so, February financials, um, I'll kind of reel through this. Um, so, the general education and adult education is uh, $28.3 million worth of revenue and $32.5 million worth of expenses for a net expense of $4.2 million. Remember, um, our taxation doesn't show up in here. That's why um, it it um, doesn't, we always have a net expense um, for that section. Um, there are 28 special revenue accounts with activity in the current fiscal year, um, which is a total of $5.1 million worth of revenue and $6.8 million worth of expense. Um, a lot of that expense is uh, $5.2 million of it is CARES and CRF money that we spent out this year. Um, and that money is coming back in um, it because it's a reimbursement. Um, in the capital improvements, um, which are of course our high school, um, our elementary school and facilities upgrade, which we've talked about um, earlier tonight. Um, we have $1.2 million worth of revenues and $9.6 million worth of expenses. Um, for an $8.4 million worth of net expense, um, which is understandable since we've already received the bond money. Um, we currently have three uh, enterprise funds, of course, which are the School Nutrition, the Adult Education Enrichment, and Par Performing Arts Center. Uh, there's $0.5 million worth of revenues and $0.7 million worth of expenses. Um, and uh, for a net expense of 0.2 million. I think we're going to start seeing this turn a little bit now that food service is getting more kids through um, the program. So we probably will see that change a little bit towards the end of the year. Um, and then of course we have the trust funds, which are $58,000 worth of revenue and $45,000 worth of expenses for a net revenue of $13,000. Um, if you go to the second page, which is where we talk about more about our expenses and broken down into the different categories. Um, so salaries and benefits are, are $17.8 million worth of our expense. And we're $43,000 lower than last year. Um, and then um, you will see, uh, so for the groupings of 53,000 and 40, 57,000 groupings, um, purchase professional and technical services, which is at $1.4 million, which uh, property services of 295,000, other purchase services of 1.8 million, supplies and energies of, of 1 million, and property maintenance of 182,000. Um, for the total of that whole grouping, we're about $38,000 higher than the prior year. Um, of course, debt, um, we're running we're almost identical, the same amount of last year at $9.7 million. And then when you go to the bottom section of our financials, um, of course, which are in the articles that we pass our budget, um, articles one through four, which is your direct in, um, instruction, um, $14.8 million worth of expense. And articles five through seven, which is a staff, your student and staff support, which is about $4.1 million worth of expense. 
Our Article 8, which is our transportation, contributes $1.1 million. In our Article 9, which is our facilities, including um, capital improvement, um, which is at $2.7 million. Our debt, which is Article 10, is $9.4 million of our expenses. And Article 11, which is um, contributing $30,000 worth of our expenses, which is your PAC. Um, Performing Arts Center. And adult education, which is $330,000 worth of our expenses. For our total expenses of $32,528,949 year to date. The expenses are $60,000 above last year. Our current revenues is $1 million above last year. And the primary reason is subsidy is $1.3 million above last year. Uh, adult education revenue um, is $10,000 above last year, but that's primarily due to our SAD 60 amount that we share, um, Nicole Ivy 50-50. Do you have any questions? Questions, anybody? Yeah. Cheryl, do you, on, on the CARES, well, relief funds, there's too many names to them. It, it said, um, you said, you typed 5.2 million has been spent. Did, mm -hmm. did you say you're waiting for that, some of that funding or is it, have we received it all? Uh, no, we get reimbursement back. Um, so we have to bill it back to them and that takes a while because um, you have to get copies of all invoices and stuff like that. So um, it takes a little while to get it all to them. Then they go through the whole thing, ask their questions, and then they release the funds a couple of weeks after that. So it takes a little bit of a timing to get through that whole process. What, what kind of timing? I mean, you said a couple of weeks. And um, how much of it have you received? <laughs> um, for the most part, as long as I bill it out, um, they're getting pretty close to being able to turn it around within two weeks. And then it takes a good week after they turn that around before we see the funds hit our bank. Um, so for the most part, it's, I would say about a month or better. So for the most part, it's pretty good. That's the month we're using our cash, right? Yeah. Any, yep. any, are there any invoices outstanding that you're worried about that you may not see? Are you... No, I have one that I'm working on. They asked for um, some more information, but it was not uh, anything um, that they're, they're questioning. Um, I was missing a page of an invoice. Um, it probably pulled two pages through when I scanned it. Um, so once I get that to them, they'll probably turn it right around. So, and then I have uh, another one where they're just asking um, uh, clarification on one item, but once I give them that, they'll be fine. Sometimes the invoices don't really have enough information on it. And I try to catch those before I send them to them because I'll actually hand write information on them so that they get, don't have to ask back, but I missed one that really didn't have enough information on the invoice. It's actually pretty amazing considering the amount of money that government's talking about. And, and the fact that you're dealing with the government, that's uh... That's yeah. pretty good. It's a lot of work to get the billing out because depending on which program it is, um, one of them, I can only scan them in 10 page increments and then you upload them all. And this is about two inches worth of paper or more that you okay. have to upload. So it gets pretty cumbersome. I'm sitting there doing screenshots and I'm crossing them off as I upload them because you're making sure you don't miss one. Um, and that was one of the ones they were saying, oh, you don't have this invoice. Well, I must have not put it into the one of the batches and didn't realize it because um, you try to be careful with that. Uh, you you scan a group and then you find out that that batch won't upload because it's over the size limit, even though because maybe one of the invoices has a lot of dark and has a graphic on there, it increases the size of it. And then you're like, oh, now I have to cut it in half. and re-upload them and so I get that the, be, pretty cumbersome. Please be a different question. Is your time doing this eligible for relief funds? Probably. 
it to to a point, but then you would have a possibility of then reducing your funding on the other side. Well, keep track of it. We'll put an invoice <laughs> in at the end of all this. Because I'm salaried, so it doesn't really help much. Yes, it does. We'll <laughs> work on that. <laughs> it is, yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Cheryl? Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Cheryl. Okay. Can I make a motion to approve the uh, February 2021 financials as presented? Second from Mr. Rue. Any further discussion? All in favor? All in favor? That's unanimous, Matt. Um, okay, so now we've got our monthly COVID 19 uh, sick leave, sick bank compensation schedule. Um, there's really no changes to this, Matt, right? Well, a couple of things. One, I moved it to put it on this agenda because originally they uh, these benefits, when they expired on 1231-2020, they were um, uh, they were um, extended, but they are extended to March 31st, 2021, and they were going to be voluntary. And so I think we wanted to be able to kind of get an idea and some data to make sure that these were working for us. And we did find out that they recently were extended till September of 2021. They still remain voluntary. We still think that these are things that are, are very helpful uh, as we try to navigate COVID uh, for our various staff. Uh, Cheryl, do you have any um, data or any information that you wanted to share this evening? Yep, I do. Uh, so on um, the sick, let's see, for um, extending the sick leave, um, currently we've ex on the expanded FMLA, which is the COVID related portion, we've had, we've paid out 331 days. Um, so I estimate that that could be between, there's no way to really run that type of a report to tell me how much expended. Uh, so I'm estimating it's between 60 and $70,000 worth. Um, so that's what it is. Um, our normal FMLA is we paid out 775 days this year. So that kind of shows you it's about half um, or a third of our total FMLA days total. Um, the sick bank portion, we've paid out 21.5 days for the sick bank. That's uh, your attachment J4. And so that's um, what, a total of five people. Not sure if that's what I have. Yeah, so thank you, Cheryl. So uh, right now, typically what people would do is if they have to stay out for something that's COVID related, this would allow them to have the first 10, 10 days count towards that. Anything beyond 10 days, they would then have to go in and apply for the COVID sick bank. Um, for that, anything that goes beyond those opportunities are things that people do have to you then use their own sick time uh, to be able to continue to be out beyond that. And as I said, uh, as we look at this, this is something for us that uh, as we evaluate and review it, feel that it continues to work for us. We also think this is uh, continue the right thing to do with our um, with our various staff members in terms of if there's times that they have to be out and they're told to quarantine based on the guidelines and the rules that are in place, um, uh, this is the, the system's working for us uh, from our standpoint. So I, I, I still recommend that we continue to monitor it and we'd also be able to continue to go month to month just to continue to make sure that uh, this is something that is uh, continuing to work for us and also to see if there's any other changes that come on along the way um, that we have to take into account. Uh, sounds good, Matt. Um, any, anyone have a problem if I do all three together one motion? Uh, I just want to make sure. I'm trying to be a considerate, considerate chair. Uh, okay, so we make a motion to approve the COVID-10 
COVID-19 COVID sick uh, leave benefits as presented, as well as approve the amended COVID-19 sick bank for SFT collective bargaining agreement under Article 9, sick leave as presented, and to approve the amended COVID-19 compensation schedule for SFT collective bargaining agreement, Article 13 as presented. Second for Mr. Rue, any further discussion? All in favor? All in favor, that's unanimous, Matt. Okay, so now we're on to old business, which is updating of the approved budget after the final budget committee. So bear with, with me. Bear with me here as I bring up a um, presentation that I uh, have updated, but it is a presentation that I gave uh, at the um, uh, budget budget, recent budget committee meeting. Paula has to fill in some. You need to get some filler. There's a saying or something. <laughs> Oh, Matt saved you. Yeah. Okay, so um, at uh, not last week's, but at the March uh, 25th um, budget committee meeting, uh, there was a question there about the use of uh, the federal uh, dollars that we had in terms of um, what we might be able to use those for. I think there was some conversation about whether or not those could be used to help around tax relief. So mm -hmm. I gave an overview for people who aren't aware of it, the American Rescue Plan, that's what we refer to as ESSER 3, what it means to the school department. Uh, there is a $122 billion relief package for pre-K through grade 12 public schools. The state of Maine will receive uh, 411, uh, over 411 million in this relief package. Uh, 370 million of that will go to public Title I schools. Allocations are based on what districts received in fiscal year 2020 and for Part A of their Title I funds. And so what that means for Sanford is that we can expect to receive over $8.5 million in ESSER three funds. So that allocation was released the night, um, that night as I was presenting uh, to the to the budget committee um, with it. So if you look at breaking that down further, uh, those funds can be similar spent to similar S or two funds. And what that means is is expenditures related to um, air quality and school facilities, school facility repairs and improvements uh, to help with the reduction of the risk of virus transmission, addressing. Um, learning recovery and learning loss, uh, summer learning, mental health services, technology, meals during school closures, and uh, PPE and, and uh, sanitize the buildings. What was different with ESSER 3 was there was a new set aside of 20% of that funding. So 20% of the 8.5 million, that's a minimum. You can spend more than that, but at least 20% of it must be used to address learning recovery through the implementation of evidence-based interventions, such as summer learning or summer enrichment, extended school day, comprehensive after-school programs, or extended school year programs. Uh, some of those details further, when you talk about evidence-based interpretation, this term will be critical as to how flexible we are to enable the expenditures for interventions that meet that learning loss requirement. So we will be expecting the DOE to provide that list of evidence-based. Initially, we thought that that meant it had to be things outside the school day uh, or during uh, summer or vacations. That is not the case. It can be also what is utilized during the school day. But those interventions really are targeted towards a student's academic, social-emotional needs, um, and really the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on student subgroups, students experiencing homelessness and children in foster care. So what we're doing as we look at the funds that we received is the goal here is that 
these funds are for us are being used to get our kids back to school to get all of our kids back to school five days a week so that's been where our focus has been preliminary planning for next year as we are able to bring back all of our students. I talked earlier in tonight's meeting about our increasing of two days of in-person learning a week to four days and how we've been able to accommodate that. But there's also a situation where we have kids um, at, at, in um, our elementary, our middle and our high school that are not attending. So at the middle school, for example, we have, um, under 250 distance learners who are not coming into our schools. Uh, at the high school, you saw that number earlier was around 300. And then in terms of uh, at the elementary level, we've had uh, less students that originally started out the year who are doing our Sanford remote option or the Calvert learning option. So what we're taking this money in, we're looking at what's it gonna take to get everyone back to school. And a big part of that is going to be, uh, as we talked about earlier, this distancing to allow us to have the space to be able to do that. So we've already started looking at elementary. Uh, we've looked at that and in order for us to bring everyone back and, and uh, adjust those sizes, what are we going to need for staffing? What are we going to need for space? We've now transitioned over to looking at the middle school. And we've also got work going on at the high school. But what I wanted to point out was the ESSER three funds are really being focused on what it takes for our kids to get back to school five days a week. The ESSER three funds cannot be used to replace any of our existing expenditures. That's basically what it comes down to um, for that. So in addition, uh, when we were talking to the budget committee, you had all these federal funds and then you also had carryover funds. And we did not apply any of our carryover funds or at least not in a specific way to our revenue. That is something that had been done uh, years past uh, for us to be able to do that. And we have concerns about doing that because obviously that kind of creates, it, it potentially could create a cliff for you in the future, but you also um, don't know um, you've got to be able to make those revenue projections to be able to do that each year. And so as we did, and, and the school committee is well aware when we went over our uh, budget workshops with the school committee back in February and the end of January, we did talk about um, how we were initially concerned about our subsidy. We're a high receiver in Sanford, and we initially were very concerned about the impact on, the, uh, on our subsidy. For example, and, and so we, we're we concerned about future subsidy concerns uh, beyond this year. So obviously enrollment is a big driver of the subsidy. It's a big driver of the EPS formula. So we are anticipating based on that formula. And when you look at our uh, decrease in enrollment this past year, because enrollment is done of average of your current year plus your year previous. So this year we were able to have last year's enrollment help with that average. Well, next year we're anticipating if nothing's done to adjust that, that we're going to lose we're going to lose subsidy uh, of over three hundred thousand dollars. Also this year, the um, uh, Department of Education they made a change to the teacher ratio, which is used in the EPS formula, and that was only a one-time change. They, they went from a 17 to one student to teacher ratio at the elementary level to a 16 to one. So by just moving that one change, okay, we were able to um, get, uh, gain $291,000 in subsidy. We've been told that that was a one year change. So next year, by taking that and moving it back to what it was, we expect to lose 291,000. The other thing that drives the EPS formula as well is valuation for a particular um, uh, for a particular city or, or town. And so when you look at the valuation in Sanford, we are concerned that we could lose subsidy because as property values are going up, your property values go up, they expect you to be able to pay more from the local and that's when your subsidy would go down. 
So if there's no mill rate change, we could expect next year to lose almost under $750,000. So if you just look at those three areas alone, uh, if nothing changes, we could be looking at 1.3 million in lost subsidy. So that's where something where the budget committee, we're talking about using some of those federal funds or using some of our carryover for tax relief, which I understand uh, the reasoning, but I also are worried about it. So we uh, took a proactive step uh, to the budget committee beyond the budget that was approved um, going in that we passed on to the budget committee that we uh, did some hard work and we looked at looking at using some carryover. These would be one-time purchases, the offset of debt of additional revenue that we could use $50,831 of that um, in that way. We also looked like we could reduce our expenses by just under $75,000 and different things that came in there around salaries and health insurance. And then we did look at the use, look at the use of those ESSER, those federal funds, those ESSER three funds. And we did look at those funds to see what we um, feel could qualify for use of those funds. Remember, they can't be used to replace expenditures, but they also could be used for those guidelines that we looked at. And we came at over $100,000 uh, in savings there. Okay, so then when you look at that, this was how the story uh, we told our budget from when we first started back on January 25th at a 14.4% increase to where we were on March 25th for the budget committee. And the budget committee did have a recommended adjustment from that previous page. When you add all of these things up, you come to $226,447. So when you take that away from the 3.2% increase that we had of just under $500,000, that leaves a um, recommendation of $271,501, and that's a 1.7% increase. So when we presented that to the budget committee, that was something that was accepted by the budget committee. And um, that is, they accepted that, and now, have passed that on to the city uh, city council for uh, them to take action on the school budget. That's a little unusual than what has been done in the past. Typically, the city council will take action on both the school budget and the city budget combined. But the budget committee, with so much uh, uncertainty around the use of the federal funds and some other things going on in the uh, city budget, they wanted to try to postpone that in a way that they could to buy some more time so that they could really uh, present more accurate figures around that. From a school department perspective, we are um, uh, driven by the voter referendum that takes place in June. So we have to stick to the timeline so that the city council can approve a, um, the budget so that we can get all of those warrant articles and everything ready for that June referendum. So that is, um, what we have here, and uh, that leads us to the um, uh, item that we have on the agenda, which if I can bring that up, bear with me here. Yeah, and as we have what is there on the screen in terms of the as of March 25th by putting that in. So what I'd like to bring up tonight is under um, old business, a recommendation to approve our amended 2021-2022 school department budget in the amount of uh, $56,439,808 which is going to be presented to the school committee tomorrow evening. Hey, uh, yeah. Mr. Hey, Ryan, a question? I just wanted to say, you know, was it two weeks ago when you did the presentation, you did a fantastic job. I actually sent you a, a quick text. I was watching out of my office, but what I took away from it then, and what I'm taking away from it tonight is next year, we really, if I'm doing, if I'm watching this correctly, next year could be a really difficult year for, my, for us. And let's make an assumption that the health insurance doesn't go down 
So we really could be in a tough spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really at the heart of us when it comes to our carryover, trying to protect that. Uh, mm -hmm. We do eventually think that, uh, and we have uh, reason that things will get right-sized, uh, but we're going to be impacted this year, uh, next year rather, based on this year's data. And so whether or not there's going to be any other potential changes to that, maybe so uh, to help buffer that. But as of right now, I don't expect any. So I think it's prudent for us to plan accordingly um, yeah. for that. And, and you're right. That is exactly where uh, we're coming from. We understand the impact that it has on taxpayers. We're very sensitive of that. But at the same time, what we're doing this year is also something that next year we want to also be at least um, positioned next year to be able to be ready for any potential negative impacts. You know, because from my perspective sitting here, I don't ever remember being or uh, approving this, you know, the budget, knowing going forward how difficult it could be for next year. Well, it really is a 0% increase because the 1.8 is the debt increase from the bond, right? Right. Yeah, it's more, it's, a, it's actually more than that, Jonathan, uh, when you factor that in. Yes, uh, with that, um, it would be actually less. And so really for the operational budget, it's a decrease. Mm -hmm. so, Correct. Yep. I, th I agree, and kind of where, you know, John was going with it. Like, I think everybody knows that it's tough for a lot of people out there, and it would have been great to be able to come in with like a 0% increase. But with those worries down the road, if we came in flat this year by using rollover, right. next year you'd be, you know, double digit increase. And we saw that a while back here in town where they tried to go a few years with no tax increase. And instead of having 2%, 2%, 2%, you ended up with a 12% increase on year four. And, you know, to me personally, as a taxpayer, I would rather see a little incremental push versus that one big hit because you, know, you can budget for it when it's a little bit at a time, but... And it also, we also have to be careful of those cliffs that things create. When you put that in, when they go away, they're not going to be there anymore. And then that either means asking more of the taxpayers or uh, at the very least cutting positions. And that's something else that right now is the school department that um, we want to be very careful of as well. Yeah. Um, any more questions? Okay, I'll make a motion to approve the amended 21-22 school department budget in the amount of $56,439,808 for presentation to the Sanford City Council. Second? Anybody? I'll second it. Amy's going to second it this time. <laughs> <laughs> Keep pointing to it. Is Amy here tonight? I know. He always looks to me. He really needed a coffee. Any, uh, any discussion? Anybody? Okay, all in favor? All in favor. That's unanimous, Matt. Okay, let's move on to resignations. Looks like you got a few. Yeah, resignations. Uh, a couple of those are coaching positions upcoming here in the uh, spring. Uh, Diana Allen and Brock Sanborn for middle school track. We also had a resignation in Central Kitchen, uh, Brianna LaFrance. Um, and uh, we did also have one that took effect at the end of March, Elizabeth Arsenal, our kindergarten teacher. So uh, those are coming. We do have a couple of people that have announced resignations uh, um, after this school year ends. Uh, Gail Malone's been a Title I teacher at MCS the last few years. Uh, we hired her out of retirement, I think, the first time, uh, and she's been a great addition. And then uh, probably the big one uh, is uh, Chuck Potter, who's been a longtime administrator um, in Sanford, uh, has announced his retirement as the MCS principal effective at the end of this uh, school year. So I want to thank everybody, but a big thanks to Chuck Potter. Uh, he was a longtime principal at Willard for many years. Um, and so Chuck has uh, made a great uh, contribution, a great impact to the Sanford School Department over the years. And he is definitely, definitely going to be missed. And we wish Chuck nothing but the best as he drifts off into retirement. And during the tour of uh, um, Margaret Chase Smith, I, I learned he's a day older than me and he's retiring. So I'm doing, I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you're on your business. That's yeah. the problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Matt. Let's move on to staff appointments. 
Uh, staff appointments. Uh, you heard Steve uh, and Beth talk about summer programming, how we really got out in front of it uh, with the uh, Title I and the Jump Start in the extended school year. Uh, so what you'll see here um, in alphabetical order is a lot of those uh, summer positions uh, have already been um, uh, put forth. Uh, and we also have um, a few, uh, we're still fin uh, filling in for those extended school year in Title I um, for that. Beyond those summer programs, uh, I did also uh, want to point out that we do have a JV softball coach, uh, John Hamilton, hired for that. We've also done some of the uh, STEAM staff for the middle school program uh, going on there. Uh, Megan Look also going on with that. Hiring Heather Maxwell as a long-term sub at grade one at the Willard School um, for that. And um, varsity girls tennis coach, we're um, nominating Sarah Preston for that position. And uh, another STEAM leader, Julie Williams at the middle school. And I think you can see the rest of all the summer um, extended school year in Title I. Um, Excellent. Thanks, Matt. And uh, then we have a uh, staff transfer. Uh, yeah, staff transfer. Uh, proud to announce that Dan May is moving from the second shift uh, custodian at, um, at Sanford Middle School to be the head custodian at Wheeler School. He replaces uh, Jason Dudley, who moved on to be the assistant director of facilities and maintenance. Some big, uh, big boots to fill. Hopefully he's up to the task. <laughs> we have uh, staff nominations next. Yeah, uh, I'd like to nominate uh, Alice Marie Allen. Uh, for us to be able to bring back students uh, increase from two days to four days, uh, one of the challenges we had around that at Carl J. Lamb School was uh, around our uh, self-contained special education program. And so in order to be able to do that, we needed to hire more staff. And so we have been able to bring on um, Alice uh, Marie Allen to be able to come into position for that um, for the remainder of the school year. And yeah, we actually have to make a motion on this one, right, Matt? Yes. I'll make a motion to approve the nomination as presented. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Oh, Paula's going to second oh, this one. Paula. We're working our way around the room. You're right? You're right. Right. You're right, John. We can work our way around on the motions, too, if we want to. Uh, any discussion? Anybody? All in favor? All in favor? Welcome aboard, Alice Marie. Uh, okay, so now, oh, this is the highlight of the evening. Policies and procedures. Steve, you're back up. That's always the last thing in the evening, too, the highlight, yeah. Um, there it is. I don't know why. Yeah. We're, we're trying to keep people tuned in. We don't want them to watch this and then turn it off. We're going to keep them all the way to the end of the program. Um, we have a, a policy and a procedure tonight. Uh, the following updated policy is presented for a second reading. Policy IKF, which is graduation requirements. Policy IKF was last updated in August 2017. Um, on June 5th, 2019, Governor Mills signed into law PL 2019, Chapter 202, which repealed proficiency-based diplomas and added the ability to count equivalent standards in um, place of course credit. The change took effect on September 19th, 2019. Since 2019, Sanford has continued with traditional course credits to determine graduation requirements. Um, the major updates to this policy include the elimination of the proficiency-based diploma requirements in the proficiency-based language, and it adds that one credit of personal finance, and the recommendation is to um, accept policy IKF um, graduation requirements as presented. And then the second one is a procedure. Um, and it is the Federal Procurement Administrative Procedure, DJE-R. Um, in a recent review of the Sanford School Department's federal title grants by the Maine Department of Education, um, we discovered that our procedures governing purchases involving federal awards was not in our policy manual as required. Um, we were following this procedure, but it just wasn't in our manual. The proposed federal procurement procedure governs the procurement and purchase of property, goods, and services using any federal award. 
in whole or in part that is subject to the uniform grant guidance um, by the government. And the recommendation is to accept procedure DJE-R uh, for our first reading. Uh, that one seems kind of important considering all the federal money we were just talking about. <laughs> well, actually it's, it's timely. At the superintendent's conference on Friday, they said districts should review um, their, proce their um, procedure. And that was for once I said, we already did that. That's good. Let's go ahead of the game. So thank you, Cheryl. Thank you to Cheryl as well. Cheryl was a big part in putting this one together. So I wanted to ask who had the time to realize that we were missing this? Is that Cheryl? So <laughs> I actually went looking for it and couldn't find it. <laughs> so no. well. <laughs> Now you realize you don't have something. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. <laughs> okay, I'll make a motion to adopt policy IKF as presented. Second for Paula. Any discussion? All in favor? All in favor. And I'll also make a motion to accept the first reading of procedure DJE R as presented. Do I have a second? Paula again. <laughs> Any discussion? Oh, All in favor? All in favor? That's unanimous as well. Good work, Steve. Uh, next up, we have items for future agendas. Um, one, of the things I want to, one of the things I want to bring up, which we have before, is get that workshop scheduled to talk about uh, kind of the direction of the five-year plan. Yes. Um, so I'm thinking maybe, I know vacation's coming up, so maybe after we get back from that, as we get into the beginning of... Uh, Man, is it May already? Yeah. Wow. Know. That's crazy. So, hey, Matt, can we kind of put that on the radar to get that workshop scheduled? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the other thing, we talked a few times, and Jonathan kind of just brought it up earlier when we were talking about the CARES funds and starting to kind of ask about the money and where it's going. We had discussed at one point about kind of wanting to have more information about that. So I didn't know what we kind of talked batted around, I think a while back about having a workshop where we went over where the care, CARES funds have kind of gone and what we have coming in and kind of looking forward to how much it's gonna That's right. be getting paid out. I think that kind of ties in with the summer programming. So I don't know if maybe we should have something that combines those two. What does everybody think about that? What'd you say? <laughs> I think where, where the federal money's gone. Yeah. How much yeah. will come in and then tie into the summer stuff? Yeah, Matt. Yeah, I think that's going to be important that um, we um, discuss what we have plans for that ESSER three funding as well as the summer programming. And so I think a workshop connected with that, along with also discussing ESSER one and ESSER two funding as well. I think that would, that's a great idea. I think that um, I, I'd recommend we do that. Yeah, and that's something where I think once we have the workshop, we could then present it at the a, a committee meeting right afterwards. Um, you know, cause I'd like to be as transparent as possible with the community, but I just think that's such a big discussion. I don't think we can have the, the meat of it during an actual meeting. So we'll have the workshop, which of course is open to the public. And then um, we can really kind of go over what comes out of that at a meeting subsequent to that. So anything one thing, else? Anybody? One thing you'll know when you look at the meetings coming up, our next meeting is uh, April 26th. Uh, but then our meeting after that is, I don't think the next one is till the second Monday in May. So we might be able to meet on that first Monday in May. Um, which would be the week after the 26th, which I think might work out well for a workshop. That's a good idea. Maybe May 3rd, because that would be best for me because I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it works for Amy, so it's a God. Let's schedule it now. Let's just put it in, make well, it happen. So are you on the calendar or are you on future items, future agenda? Are we doing future agenda items right now? Okay. Just you have anything? Yeah, but I'm good. I just want to do my you guys to adjourn and have me sitting here with my hand up. <laughs> we forgot <laughs> something. Did anyone tell Jonathan we were done? <laughs> so a couple of things. I, I just I won't get too long winded, but I would love to done. see and maybe it's for the uh, workshop, but there's a lot that goes on in the school, and I wonder if the five of us can can truly represent the community as well as maybe we ought to be. When I think of the 
PTA or PTO, I don't know what the title is, if they have issues, might they occasionally report to us? Uh, are we truly meeting the needs of our community, the five of us? You know, we used to be elected, city council used to be elected by wards, you know, used to, and it's, a lot of things have changed in our community. And, and I just want, I hope that we're representing all students, all families, and I bring it up to, to, in case we're not. I want to believe we are, but I would love to hear from a group of parents who maybe don't have a voice. I don't know how to, I don't know how to find that group. So I'll just leave that open for a second. Otherwise, in, in the world that we live in now, I think about, um, I'd like to play a role in my next volunteer role, like in immigration and, and diversity. And I wonder if we are doing a good enough job as I'll just say new members of our community come in, are we ready to serve them? That's kind of a very vague statement. I think you understand what I'm saying. But I just want to talk about that. Is that too big? No. Workshop agenda. Yeah, that's a, it kind of falls where we always talk about communication and contact and making sure that we really do know exactly what's happening out there. I, I, I doubt we do as well as we should. Yeah. I'm not picking on any of us. I'm just, so are we hearing from folks that we, you know, and the ones that are falling behind? Just yeah. don't know who to talk to. Well, I think as we're coming, you know, as we talk about coming out of this COVID thing, you know, that's that, that part of the, the uh, community that you want to get to. You know, those kids that have disconnected from school. You know, the parents that need the help, it's it's even more important right now. That's where you try to JMG them out. today really resonated with me. Or that. drop out prevention. There's right. several hundred kids not coming to school. Yeah. How many of are they all going to come back? I don't think so. Right. Not for a couple of years. So, yeah. How do you entice them out of the woodwork or don't know? Someone that can go out and go to them. Yeah. Okay. Anything else anybody has? Okay, uh, then we will move on to calendar. Uh, we've got the uh, city budget committee is tomorrow night at 6 p.m. and that's via Zoom. Uh, so Matt and we'll do, we'll do a presentation there for that and hopefully the uh, city councilors are as supportive of us as the budget committee was. Um, Monday the 12th is wellness committee meeting. Uh, our next regular meeting is Monday the 26th. Uh, being that school vacation is the uh, the 19th. And then we have an SRTC advisory committee meeting on the 30th. Are uh, you got anything to add to that, Matt? Yeah, quite a few things. Uh, uh, business is picked up, we're busy. Our first dropout prevention committee meeting is gonna be held tomorrow at 2.45. Uh, our next teacher negotiations meeting is this Wednesday from 12 to 2. Uh, that'll be uh, followed by a custodian negotiations meeting this Wednesday from 2.15 to 4. We also have uh, fact finding later on with our custodial unit on April 28th at 2. This Wednesday, Legacy Foundation is going to meet at 4. Um, I also have a Southern Maine Regional Service Center meeting this Thursday morning. Um, the next leadership team meeting with the city is this week, this Thursday at 10. Uh, the next Performing Arts Center Advisory Committee meeting is next week. It's going to be next Monday at 3.15. Uh, and we also have to schedule a student disciplinary hearing um, for a second time, uh, JICH policy offender. And we're looking at either Monday, March 12th at 5.30 or Wednesday, March 14th at 4.30. And I'm in March, I know you uh, April. April, April. Oh, that's right. Uh, April 12th, I'm sorry, Monday, April 12th at 5.30, or Wednesday, April 14th at 4.30. 14th would be best for me. I can't do either, so. Paul, you're a dog in charge, I'm good. All right. All right. Are you gonna have Liz send a thing out an email for that, Matt, just to finalize, or you want to finalize? Well, well I didn't. I didn't know uh, out of those two options if they're both bad or. Um... Any, how's the fourteenth for everybody else? Fine. You're out. Fourteenth uh, is good for Amy, Paula, and Jonathan. Is that good? That's it. Four. 
Uh, Studier. Studier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I lost. There's a lot of time. Right so tired. <laughs> no, it's fine. Just give me a translate. Just a bit. You know, he's typically in bed. But. <laughs> Well, in the update I sent, I had it listed as March, so I yeah. Uh, yeah, he's got this Jonathan has it as a calendar for March now. Uh, so uh, what time was that? Uh, what time was it on the 14th? Uh, 4.30. Yes, the parent in this situation can't do it before 4.30. Okay. <sighs> That's awesome. Okay, do you have anything else? For the I'll have I'll have Liz sent something out tomorrow about that. Um, just to firm it up. Good plan. Hey Matt, did you say something about the custodians on the 28th fact finding? Yes. I sent that out last week, but that's where we're scheduled two o'clock on uh Wednesday, April 28th. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, do you have anything else, Matt? Go up and, um... No, that's it. Anybody else have anything they want to share for calendar announcements? No, we're all good. Uh, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, do we have a second? Second from Paula. All in favor? All in favor. We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody.